Uh, good evening, everybody. This is uh, January 14th, uh, 2016, regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee. Welcome. Um, we begin with uh, a moment of silence for Christopher Landford, who worked with us with METCO, uh, who unfortunately lost her, his life uh, over the weekend. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of very impressive art around the room. Um, there is from the AP Studio Art drawing, the large charcoal, charcoal observational figure drawings displayed uh, demonstrate the advanced placement art students pushing their boundaries about what a drawing can be and how to create it. Then from the AP Studio Art design, the photographs we see, uh, photographs, these things are I think over, yeah, yeah. Uh, are from digital photography and AP design students. Uh, contour and Zentangle portraits from Miss Mo uh, Muse, Muse, M U I S E, yes, Muse, Miss Muse. Muse. We have a Muse in the art department. That's inspiring. Uh, students explore the ability of line to communicate exaggeration, expression, and form through a mixed media portrait project. Then there's nose, eye, mouth, and ear painting, similarly from Mrs. Muse, uh, as students studied elements of portraiture, including eyes, nose, ears, mouth, and brought them to life in paint. Then there's pixelated portraits, again, Mrs. Muse. Students began this project by experimenting with monochromatic value paintings with smoothed and stippled variations. And hand paintings, again, Mrs. Muse, Throughout art history, artists have explored the possibility of hands as a vehicle to convey, convey personal emotions. Um, color symbolism and embroidery from Mrs. Rebola Thompson. Students created an original line drawing that was then heat transferred onto canvas, painted, embroidered, and framed, and silhouette and symbols a self-portrait using personal identity webs as inspiration, students created silhouette self-portraits that were filled with visual symbols that define them in some way. Personality, interests, talents, dreams, goals, values, etc. And the Zentangles, again by Mrs. Rebola Thompson, students created Zentangle drawings one line at a time, expanding each drawing square by combining several tangles or patterns in an unplanned way. So that's what we've got around the room. It's uh, very impressive. We now go to public <coughs> participation. By our policy, public participation sessions are limited to three minutes. Uh, we are happy to listen to you. Uh, we do not respond back in public session. Uh, we may ask you to come back for a subcommittee meeting or reg regularly scheduled meeting if uh, that necessitates an agenda item, but we don't discuss things presented here. First uh, is Jane Morgan. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jane Morgan. I'm a Stratton parent of a third grader, two first graders, and a two-year-old. Um, and last week at our PTO meeting, Mr. Hainer came and talked us through some of the work that the budget subcommittee is doing um, and making some decisions about all of the proposals, all of which look great, obviously, and I recognize that this is a group that would fund all of them were they able to, but you guys need to make some choices about which pieces you're going to be able to do for next year. Um, and he suggested that if there were pieces that were compelling for us, that we share that with you so that you knew that. Um, for me, the, the biggest piece for my family, I'm not a budget, school budget expert at all. Um, I'm a kindergarten parent expert, I'd like to think, because I've had three kindergartners in the last three years. So I've been a kindergarten parent a lot of times. And for my family, the, the of course it's the biggest item, it's the biggest money piece, but um, would be the full-time kindergarten aides. Um, my daughter was in kindergarten, she's in third grade um, at Stratton when Thompson was there. She had a phenomenal, incredible aide in her kindergarten class who has gone on to become a full-time kindergarten teacher at Thompson. She was outstanding. Um, the value by, you know, divided by salary that 
was received for her would have been extraordinary because she was so good. Last year, my twins were in kindergarten at Stratton. They definitely, you know, it happens sometimes in kindergarten where you just get a mix of kids because you don't know who you're going to get. And there definitely were a group of them that shouldn't have been together. Um, and that happens, you know, and, and they're in first grade now and all everybody's been split up and everything is great. So it's all fine. But I think they would have benefited so much from having a full-time aide in their classroom um, because so much of what went wrong there happened at the end of the day because five and six-year-olds get really tired. <laughs> and it's hard when you're in school and doing hard academic work all day to make it to now 2.30 and keep yourself together. And having another body in the room until 2.30 would be fantastic. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Next will be Juliet Moore. Hello, and thank you so much um, for taking my comments. And I want to say thank you all for all of your um, all the time that you spend. Um, I've been trying to keep up with you at some of your meetings and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so I've been going to a lot of things, but I wanted to come tonight first to give an update, um, a bit of an update on the survey that an Arlington pa parent enrollment group developed to gather data to help shape the conversation around enrollment issues at the middle school. On Tuesday night at the task force meeting, Steve Liggett, um, updated in real time and we wanted to take this opportunity to share some very preliminary results. The, the survey's still open, um, but to share some preliminary results with the Greater School Committee. Um, we've had 768 respondents, which was I really, really pleased that we had such a wide representation and it's really nicely um, distributed across town at this point um, and we're still trying to push it out into different places, um, different people that might not have had a voice yet. Um, and just to be brief, because I know I have a very short period of time, but in terms of um, what people felt in favor of or strongly in favor of um, and some of the um, options that we gave, um, permanent or tempor temporary modules um, 20, at the Audison, 22% um, were in favor or strongly in favor. Having Gibbs as an East Arlington Middle School, 74% of res the respondents were in favor. Using Gibbs as a town-wide sixth grade, 41% strongly in favor or in favor. Um, using Gibbs as an eighth grade, um, 23 percent. Bringing um, the eighth grade to a renovated high school, um, 17 percent were in favor or strongly in favor. <coughs> to change the, um, the school year in terms of like the time, trying to make an all, um, <coughs> to change the time, like go through the summer, things like that, 4 percent in favor or strongly in favor. Permanent building on the crusher lot, was 42% um, in favor or strongly in favor. And I realize that this is a snapshot in one moment of time, and um, that as information comes out, people's opinions may change. Um, but I think it's very important when you have such large proportions of people um, stating their opinions that we, um, that, that should be acknowledged. Um, so that was one, um, that was my prime, Preliminary, um, my first thing that I wanted to talk about, the second thing I want to talk about, I may be running out of time, but I just wanted to make a mention of our case for the um, East Arlington Neighborhood Middle School um, and all the benefits that can come from that. Um, I'm putting together some data, so what I'll do, and a lot of people are contributing it, to it, is um, share it with you as a document, so that way you'll have an opportunity to read it. But it includes things like making um, a walkable middle school will allow um, better school accessibility for students on IEPs. Um, parents of those students meet annually at least and very often um, more than that. And significant differences are found between students, who parent, students whose parents participate in their IEP meetings and those who don't um, with higher um, overall grade point averages in, for students whose parents can participate. When you bring a school into a neighborhood, you're be better able to allow parents who don't have access to cars, who don't have access to transportation, um, better access to the school. Um, I have so many things to talk about and about um, how proximity at school can have a positive effect on attendance, how placing a middle school closer to the majority of Arlington's low-income housing will um, 
decrease the likelihood of absences and tardiness due to transportation issues. Um, low income students are four times more likely to be chronically absent than others, um, often for reasons beyond their control, including transportation. So I have okay. so many different points and I don't want to take up too much time of the school Oh, we're over three minutes now. So, so we're all well over three minutes now, so I'll send that out to you, but I just wanted yeah, to share uh, some of the highlights. It, pl please uh, share it with us in writing, especially when you get, uh, when you close the survey so we can see the numbers. Absolutely, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Mara Vatz. You think we're cousins, maybe? Uh, yeah, I think probably. <laughs> um, so my name is Mara Vatz, and uh, I'm here to basically, I'm seconding what Jane said about the kindergarten aides. Uh, we just bought a house in Arlington this fall. We moved from North Cambridge. Uh, I have two kids. The oldest one is four, and she'll start kindergarten at the Thompson School in 2017. And the public schools was the major reason why we decided to move to Arlington and buy a house. Uh, I watched all of my friends struggling with the, um, with the Cambridge Kindergarten Lottery. We wanted nothing to do with that. Uh, we loved the neighborhood schools in Arlington. Um, but now that we're here and uh, I you know, have seen the uh, enrollment studies, I'm a little bit nervous about kindergarten. Um, they're gonna be big classes. My daughter's not used to that. She's in a, a preschool class of 20 right now and there are often four mm -hmm. adults in the room and it is still chaos. <laughs> I mean, it's a great, we're very happy with it, but you know, 20, four and five year olds, mm -hmm. is, it's chaos. So uh, it would be very important just to my peace of mind and to my daughter's peace of mind to have more adults in the room throughout the day. And as Jane said, afternoons are extremely difficult for young children. Uh, my daughter still naps often in the afternoon. Um, she obviously won't when she's in kindergarten, but they're still coming off of that and the afternoons are a tough time. Um, and any kind of transition of personnel is also difficult for small children mm -hmm. if they feel particularly attached to an aide who then has to leave during the day. That's an emotional disruption that would happen every day. Um, those are my main points. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now come to the review and approval of the AHS program of studies for, two, for the 2016-17 school year. <coughs> Dr. Bodie. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Janger and Mr. McCarthy to come up. Uh, Mr. McCarthy is the system principal at the school and he does a lot of the work on, on the program of studies as well as scheduling of the high school. And Dr. Janger, our high school principal, welcome to both of you. Good evening. Thank you. I'm just grab yours because mine seemed to have fallen into my stack. Um, thank you very much for having us here. Um, so what we've distributed to the school committee at this point is a two-page list of changes in the program of studies, not typos and clarifications of language, but substantive changes. Um, and then the new program of studies itself. As you can see there, we're not envisioning a wide range of changes this year, um, in part because given staffing levels and the anticipated non-large increases in staffing, we don't really have a lot of flexibility in terms of what it is we're doing, and a lot of it, what we're gonna do, will be within the context of classes that we already have. Um, there are a couple of things I just wanted to direct people's attention to. Uh, the first is a policy update, and if you look at the top, there's a statement there. Our past practice has been to allow students six weeks to decide whether or not to take an honors or a um, curriculum A-level class in what are called heterogeneous classes, or to drop a class without there being anything on there um, transcript um, on reviewing this with students and guidance. We've come to the determination that that six week wait period isn't doing the teachers or the students any favor. Um, it tends to put students in a position of being behind the eight ball if they wait six weeks to make a final choice on classes. So we're looking at for next year putting that to a three week change period. Um, hopefully that will mean that we can settle our classes and get students focused more quickly. And we're focusing on having guidance do a lot more talking to people beforehand about making those choices right in the start. Um, <clears throat> as you'll see again, the list of classes, the one thing I particularly wanted to note 
was that a number of these classes are 2.5 credit classes. One of the things we use these classes for is to find out if there's interest, but also to see whether we can shift the way classes are structured. So sometimes we'll float a class out there to see which students um, enroll in them. The reason we switched over to trying to create more half credit, half, I'm sorry, half year classes, mm -hmm. that are 2.5 credit classes, is in order to give students more flexibility in their schedule, both to avoid having unnecessary study halls, but also to try a lot of things earlier on in their program. Um, we have a wide range of options, but we don't have a lot of slots early on in the student's mm -hmm. career for them to be able to try a lot of things. Um, so those are the main things. If you look at um, courses that we've removed, most of those are courses that um, did not have high levels of interest or have been consolidated into other programs. Anything else you'd like to say, Mr. McCarthy? No. Okay. Questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Heiner. I apologize for not asking it earlier. Uh, the change from the three to six weeks, uh, are you, how are you going to go about publicizing this so I don't turn around and say, I didn't know, in the fourth week? So we end up, uh, it's put in the program of studies. It's sent out in the guidance newsletter. We send multiple reminders through email, and we do post it on our website as well. Is your handbook uh, electronic or is it paper? Both. So would you be making the, the change at least on the electronic? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. And we reprint it every summer, so we would have new updated copies for next year. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. The Curriculum Instruction Assessment and Accountability Subcommittee met beforehand to uh, meet with uh, Bill and Matt to uh, go through the uh, changes, and we voted 3-0 to zero to endorse them. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this? Um, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Thiel motion by Mr. Thielman. So moved. Second by Mr. Pierce. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. to have... I yeah. I don't know if the committee would like to hear anything about some of the um, changes that have happened at the high school <coughs> this year, one of which is the advisory program. Um, and this was a, a funding issue as well as our budget last year. And contractual. Pardon? And contractual. A and contractual, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but it's an opportunity. They're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Talk to we, so I just saw Senator Donnelly come in, but mm -hmm. we could have a few minutes if there's any questions. I, I also, for parents that are, are listening, I think the high school has been doing um, a lot of innovative work, particularly around the internship program. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that as well. How long do we have? <laughs> well, um, so first, the, uh, the advisory. So backing up from the advisory, this year, um, we switched from a seven-day rotating schedule, which many people found difficult to follow, to a five-day rotating schedule. In gaining a little bit of time around less passing time and sort of more efficient use of time, we were able to create two periods as a, they, we call an X block. Um, on Tuesdays, that X block is an opportunity for students to sort of de-stress, to meet with students, to meet with teachers for support, to meet with clubs for support. Um, and then on Thursday, we have a committee of teachers, it's a teacher-led committee, developing advisory programs. And the goal of advisory is to build relationships, to be an efficient conduit for communicating things to students without pulling people out of class time, to minimize interruptions in the school day and the school routine, and to build a positive climate and culture. Um, and we've been working with a consultant over the last year, developing trainings for the staff and doing this, um, and working with the students around a whole curriculum of activities. One of the wonderful things about it, actually, as a professional development tool is fun, um, is that it's a rare opportunity that in high school, all of our specialists are doing the same thing. And so when we're learning things about questioning students or working with groups or classroom management, um, those tools become tools that translate into the kind of teaching and learning we want in the regular classroom. Because you could do it in this coaching environment, but in the end, coaching and building relationships and conversational practice and discourse mm -hmm. is what we want to be seeing in the regular classroom as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've started to work a lot more on in internships, which um, last year we, I think, had 15. This year we were up to about 25 or 30. We're hoping to have about 70 to 80 next year in terms of placements. Um, so the internships are now a relatively structured curriculum opportunity for students to have job experiences during their junior and senior year. And the placements range from you know, MGH working in hospitals to working in labs, to working with lawyers, to working doing culinary work. 
um, it's really a wide range of opportunities, and I hope that's something that really grows. I think it's something we might consider really expanding as something that becomes a common experience for all students. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we have. Are there other things that are on my head list? Um, I think the other thing that's worth noting also, while I've got a moment at the microphone, is where we've been going with technology in terms of the high school. Um, just two years ago, the high school teachers had um, XP computers that would take a fairly long time to boot up. Last year, we were able to give everybody new MacBooks and begin to make sure that everybody had uh, projection in every classroom and experiment with Chromebooks and iPads. This year, um, with support from the AAF and the Capital Committee, um, we have um, a laptop cart with instrumentation in science. We have nine Chromebook carts which are being piloted by groups of teachers in terms of a connected classroom environment. Um, we have Chromebooks sort of in small supplies all throughout the school. And it's really been remarkable. I was sort of figuring that the level of participation and impact on classrooms would take two or three years more than where we are now. But many of the students were already, even without having gone anywhere near what's called a bring your own device or a one-to-one -one sort of environment, classrooms are already really working on Google Classroom and other connected things to be largely paperless and doing large levels of interactive work. Um, so we're hoping in the next year to really move, as I've said, if you looked at digital devices in the high school about three years ago, our policy was do not bring them to school. Um, in the last two years, we've switched to you can bring them to school, and I would assume that over the next years after that, we will be switching to please bring them to school. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea is that I think we're getting to the point now where we have enough, we're, we're within reach of having enough devices so the teachers know they can get their hands on what they need to do instruction. Mm -hmm. And we can supplement that with devices that the kids are able to bring from home. I think at this point, things like Chromebooks mm -hmm. can be gotten for 110 to $250, mm -hmm. and they have a huge educational impact. And mm -hmm. once students know that that's something that's useful to have in class, they'll bring mm -hmm. them. The other thing that's remarkable right now is that most kids have one of these, mm -hmm. and um, although they can be distractions managed well in the classroom, they're great um, instructional devices as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, hearing none, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take some things out of order, I would, uh, and there are a couple of housekeeping things. I did not mention that Dr. Allison Ampey is homesick today. Uh, she's recovering from the <coughs> virus that seems to be going around and has affected a couple of the other members. Um, I want to welcome uh, a Bishop Bear to the table. Liz Higgins is a grade one teacher at the Bishop School. She's the second vice president of AEA and uh, uh, won the right to come sit in the AEA rep seat for, for the school committee meeting and we're happy to have you. Um, the website design item on the agenda will be postponed because there are going to be some changes as a result of some discussion. Uh, we don't have the legislators here, so we'll move on to the draft calendar oh. item. Yep. Yeah. We, we have one. <laughs> we, we're, going to, we're going to wait oh, for the other two. We said 7 15, oh. so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're going to wait for the other two. Uh, we have them scheduled for 7 15, and we have one. So, uh, you know, to give them uh, a full uh, group, we'll move down the agenda. Uh, to the review draft calendar for 2016-17, Dr. Bodie. Um, what, we're, what I would like to have happen tonight is that the committee take this as a first read, mm -hmm. and uh, we would have a, a vote on the draft calendar for next year at the next meeting. I think parents right now are very would very, very much like to know what the first day of school will be next year and won't be the last. Um, as we've done in the past, we, we will not have um, on here where the parent conferences are, but I would hope to be able to give you that information sometime this spring and publicize it. The, um, so the first day of school has not changed in terms of structure. We are going to begin on the Tuesday after Labor Day next year, which uh, puts our, our last day, I believe, at uh, the 27th. Uh, day 185 is the 27th. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, day, if we have no snow, uh, day 180 is June 20th. Yes. I know that the the AEA is interested, and as I am as well, of trying to set uh, some calendars up this spring that show the start date for September 18, as well as the the year after. 
But for right now, uh, what we need to do is to get this publicized so parents know they can plan uh, their summer plans and uh, any, any, any major vacations next year during school vacations to know exactly when they are occurring. Yeah, um, Kersey has sent me some questions for the meeting, which I'll read, and her one was partially answered right now. When are we going to get ahead and plan out calendars, at least start dates more than a year in advance? Um, so I guess that is an effort <coughs> we're going to be making with AEA to try to, to uh, establish calendars for another couple of years. And uh, when, when might we have uh, a point where we can start talking to that with, the, uh, with AEA? There there have been conversations with the idea that it would not change next year and, you know, in the future. It's on the radar. Yeah, I think the, 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 the commitment that we made was that if we're going to make a structural change, we'd give people at least a year's notification so that if in 2017 we wanted to start before Labor Day, that we'd make, we'd make that decision before the end of this uh, the school year so that people had more than a year to plan it out. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. Um, last year we got real close uh, to the end of the year, and as seasons change, I appreciate at the bottom of this, below the calendar, there's a list of holidays and religi religious observances. And we have added, we have three days in our calendar right now. Mm -hmm that in my mind uh, should be eliminated and respected within this list and give us a little bit more of a buffer, not for next year, as part of the conversation going forward. Um, we have in, our, in the teachers and staff contracts and everything else, the recognition that if it's not part of the regular calendar and some person has an observance, they have a right to go to their supervisor through the superintendent and everything. And as far as I know, it's always been respected. Um, i not looking for this just on a matter of uh, squeaking three more days for our calendar, but as you look at this list, it's quite comprehensive. And there's no way a school system could ever function if we call, close school on every one of these days. So in my mind, uh, going forward, I'd like us to look at this as a, a factor, observe the individual's uh, uh, beliefs and things of that nature and respect them and the students. Uh, but everyone get treated the same. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, so Linda Hant and I uh, brought before the Community Relations Subcommittee um, the possibility of doing sort of a joint parent-teacher survey to ask some of these questions, for example, about religious holidays, um, about Labor Day. Mm -hmm. um, and we would like to, and we were talking sort of about the end of January, we, we think that's a good thing to do now when we still have enough time to gather that input, to help us inform about future decisions. Um, and we agree that we that it, it would be wrong to make any changes for next year. I think mm -hmm. people's lives are complicated enough, <laughs> I know mine is, that, that crazy as it is, you sort of plan out a year or and a half in advance. And, and so we just really need to give people the opportunity um, to, uh, it needs to take a while to, to make those changes. But we do want to ask the community, we want to talk to teachers, and we want to get their insight in what their preferences are. It could be that it's even, that you know, <laughs> there's no clear answer, but it could be that we have some clear answers, and so it'd be good to know. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Thielman. In last year's calendar, we put in the uh, school committee meeting dates. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, uh, Maybe it was a policies and procedures subcommittee or somebody mm -hmm. did that. So we should probably make sure that's in here. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion. Um, uh, okay, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> um, I'd actually like to make a motion that we change the dates of school committee meetings. And my reasoning is that it's very common for um, middle school and high school events to happen on a Thursday. And so last year, for example, the um, athletic parent student night the freshman orientation, the open house of the high school. Um, we have a big, uh, something coming up on mental health and suicide awareness, all happening on a Thursday during school committee meetings. There were other events that happened on Thursdays that didn't happen to happen on school committee meetings, but they could have, you know, with the luck of the calendar. Um, it seems easier to change our calendar than to ask high school and middle school to change their um, approach, which I, th I think they've chosen Thursday as for a reason that I think we should respect. Do you have a date? 
So that is my motion. My motion is, uh, so I, I actually don't care. <laughs> so either Tuesday or Wednesday, I think it would be a better date. I'll second it for the purpose uh, of discussion. Okay. Well, well, well hold, hold on. I, I will not entertain a vote on this, but I would entertain a discussion okay. and, uh, and entertain a motion to send that question to the appropriate subcommittee. Mr. Thielman. Okay. Yeah, so it's, there's a policy that we would have to amend. So the policies mm -hmm. yeah. and... So, so that I, goes to policies yeah. and So what I would do is I would... I'd, I'd like to amend your motion to direct the policies and procedures subcommittee to study okay. uh, mm -hmm. this issue and also recommend meeting dates for next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. Okay. And, and, and report back by when, Paul, what do you think? Um, do we not currently, do we currently have a policy? Why don't we uh, ask them to report back by the first meeting in February? By the first meeting in February. <laughs> and, no pressure. <laughs> I mean, it's seven of us. I mean, th th this isn't that difficult. No. Right. It was um, very difficult the last time we did it. I understand, but I mean, it, it is seven of us. Sure. Uh, the other thing I'd like the subcommittee to look at as well as the meeting date is the meeting time. Um, I would be very grateful to have an extra half hour before we start. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, Cindy's going ick, <laughs> but, you know, by the time I get home, I can barely run through the house, feed the cat, turn around, and come, well, come you, here. Okay. So there, there, you know, there are three or four or five or six years ago, right, when you first came out, there was a lot of debate on this, mm -hmm. so we yeah. have, there's a history, I think you might have been taking, you, you took your, your, I was, I was <laughs> on, your leave. I, I, when I left the committee in 2007, we were meeting 7.30 on Tuesdays, yeah. and I came back to 6.30 on Thursday. Yeah, well, you know. Because one, it was running too late mm -hmm. yeah. at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday, mm -hmm. it cratered us for the whole week. Yes, for I, I remember that. those of us who have that. to get up at 5 a.m., mm -hmm. I am never going to move away from Thursday. So no matter what you suggest, <laughs> I will vote against it. Well, <laughs> if, if we all vote. be cratered one day, but I can't be cratered for a whole week. And it, it just, it, you know, these, uh, the meetings run too late, they run too long, and, and I just, I can't do it. So, okay. Uh, that, so, okay. So, so hold, that hold on. The chair is taking Excuse control me. of the meeting. Um, Mr. Hainer. You may be sorry. Uh, in retrospect of this chair putting forward a later time to start, I think it may fail because of the record of this chair's ending meetings. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I can take a shot at the, uh, the, the, the member who's complaining about <laughs> how long he talks in a meeting, but uh, obviously this is the only, uh, the, the constraint is this, and understand under the open meetings law, the only time we really can talk to each other is here, here in an official meeting. Right. So that I've, anyway. in, I've endeavored to give everybody a chance <laughs> to have a conversation and put out the points and, and not stifle the conversation. As long as you want to talk, I tend to let you talk. Um, it, it's who I am. Uh, and, and, and that's my style. Now, if uh, Dr. Seuss is going to run a heavier gavel uh, next year, uh, so be it, but uh, you're stuck with me until April. Uh, okay, so we have a motion to refer this whole matter to the Policies and Procedures Committee. Perfect. Um, any other conversation on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Um, Whatever is, excuse me. Oh, so oh. so we're so I don't think that we have anything else to say on the calendar except. Well, I have just, I just have a read. quick yeah. question. So this is first read. When do you want to do second read? Because I think parents do want to know when well, we're going to start and end. Mm -hmm. I would I would like to do second read at the next committee meeting. Mm -hmm. What we can do is take the results of your policy and we will look at our our early release days, and parent days. Now for elementary, the early release days are going to continue next year, on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's not going to change. So it's really taking a look at our secondary early release days. Mm -hmm. So I would expect to come back with um, an updated, with more detail um, later this spring. Mm -hmm. But what's really important right now is to, for parents to know the major mm -hmm. yeah. start dates, vacation mm -hmm. times, and all of that mm -hmm. for next year. So just to, we can approve a calendar and then... Yes, put, and the, then update put the school it. committee dates. That's exactly what we did else. last yeah, year. Yeah, we yeah, set yeah. the so we'll primary yeah. dates and then we uh, yeah. filled in the rest right. uh, okay. later on. 
So we can uh, change the, the, uh, the dates. And I think that our policy <coughs> was amended the, the last time to set it on Thursdays, but give us discretion on which Thursdays going through. Right. And if we do stay on Thursdays, I would ask uh, our staff, our principals, to not schedule major events in conflict with our meetings. Um, I mean, there are 180 school days, and we're meeting uh, 14 of them. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I, I hear what you're saying, but I think I agree with uh, Jennifer in the fact that it's much easier for us to adjust than them. Uh, it, it's, it's even difficult when having two schools not compete with each other for sets of parents. Uh, there are several meetings that I've wanted to attend that the one that you, one of the ones you mentioned tonight, and because my commitment is here, mm -hmm. right. I'm not going to be able to come. And they, it would be great if they videoed them, but they don't. Right. And well, don't they have a big event like open house? The, the, you can't find a parking. No, but the pro miles. the program that she just mentioned about suicide the prevention. The mental health and suicide, yeah, yeah. yeah. That yeah, to me is a big thing. That, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any other conversation on the issues of calendars? <clears throat> Bring none. Uh, we now have our three legislators in, in, in the room, and we'd like to welcome you to come forward to the table with the microphone. Uh, Senator Kenneth Donnelly, uh, Representative Dave Rogers, and former school committee member, former student rep, and current <laughs> state rep, <laughs> Sean Garbley. It's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, but I was sitting here. There, yeah. I was here through what both of those. <laughs> Somebody's old, Paul. I'm not sure who it is. <laughs> Somebody's moved on. Someone has it. That's not a criticism, Paul. No, you yeah. used to be, you, you weren't at the drinking age, so we couldn't go out after a meeting. We don't we anymore. Don't. We yeah, don't we anymore. Don't. No, we, we don't, don't do that. Anyway. We don't do that. Is that a violation of the open meeting law? We don't do that. No, we no, don't we do don't that. talk about business. I know in Lowell, they immediately adjourn to the bar across the street after they complete their <laughs> meeting, so... If only we had one right across the street. I mean, we they, they so nicely gave us a liquor store right next door. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. But they haven't yet put a bar close enough we to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in the rebuild. Maybe the dispensary. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. Uh, let's, we're you. getting a little, like... All right. in, 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 we're, we're just in a good mood tonight. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah, always that. always yeah. like to be you here. You get the bad news. I, I have a feeling as we get to Chapter 70, we, we might... Uh, yeah. And anyway, uh, I will start off by... Uh, asking our esteemed senator uh, to start the conversation. Great. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bodie, members of the committee. Thank you so much for having us here. And we're here to hear from the school committee on uh, what their questions are on both uh, for the foundation budget uh, and how we're going to handle that in the legislature and any other questions you have on uh, the budget issue and, and what we see on Beacon Hill on how we're going to address, um, I think, the, a, a very good report. Can you uh, give us a brief synopsis of what you think is going to happen sure. between now and June? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, we're going to do the budget. Um, the governor will be putting out his budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't figure out his math, even though we've had somewhere around $115 million in new revenue. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's saying that we're looking at a, a billion dollar structural deficit, which I don't agree, but I don't do the numbers. I'm not A and F. Um, I think that he is not going to have additional. Again, I disagree with the governor and uh, with all due respect to my colleagues, the, the uh, Speaker of the House and the, um, the Chairman of uh, the uh, Ways and Means Committee in the House, that we have a uh, we don't have a spending problem, we have a revenue problem. Mm -hmm. If you look at all of the budget items, all of the line items in the state uh, over the last 15 years, including schools, and, and they've been cut mm -hmm. in, in real inflationary dollars, they've been cut. And so, um, as a set in the Senate, I'm looking forward to, and I would love to see, a budget come out of the House that has actually taxes in it mm -hmm. or revenues in it so that we can address, I think, a very, very important issue in making sure that we fund our education system in the state. And, I, and what I see throughout the my district, and I have five communities, Billerica, Burlington, Arlington, Lexington, and uh, Woven, and it's consistent throughout those communities when talking to businessmen and talking to people that are in those communities, one of the most important decisions companies make when they come into our area 
is the school system mm -hmm. for the people they're trying to attract to these companies. Mm -hmm. We are in an area where we have a very high tech, biotech. Mm -hmm. We just saw GE come into Boston. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things they ask is when they recruit people with families, mm -hmm. Uh, they want to make sure that their children go to really top quality schools. Mm -hmm. So I fully support and would be looking forward to supporting funding for both Chapter 70 and to address this foundation budget. In the, if looking at a 25% phase in, uh, I believe the, month, the dollars are um, on the first part of the phase in, you'd be looking at $95 million. <coughs> and and when, the, uh, when it was totally phased in, you'd be looking at $431 million approximately over a four-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as I support making sure that we got the revenues to do that, that has to be generated in constitutionally, has to be generated in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to get to the Speaker and get to the Governor to um, urge them that this is a very important issue and in order to do it, we need the revenues. Uh, Mr. Garbley. Thank you. So I'll speak and maybe Representative Rogers will speak and then we'll open up to questions in whatever format mm -hmm. the chairman wants to go in. Mr. Chairman, Superintendent Bodie, members of the committee, thank you so much for having us here. It's great to have these kind of conversations. I hope we have more of them as we get closer to the release of the governor's budget and the House budget and later in May uh, the, the Senate budget. So this obviously is a huge issue for Arlington. Um, when I was on the school committee here, as Chairman uh, Schlickman raised, this was an issue that we really wanted to see. We wanted to see a report that showed not just how much we're investing in education in the Commonwealth, but what the gap is and how much we're under-investing mm -hmm. in our kids in all 351 cities and towns across the Commonwealth. And I was proud to co-sponsor uh, the amendment that got us the Foundation Budget Review Commission started along with my colleagues, and it's pretty stark, it's, it's a pretty, uh, it's, as Senator Donnelly mentioned, and I agree with everything he stated, uh, it's a pretty damning report. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a great report, it's a comprehensive report, but it really shows that we have been under-investing in education um, in, in many, many areas. And, uh, you know, we have to wrap our minds around it, around it and our hands around it, and raise the necessary revenue uh, to implement the recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is, you know, to implement all the recommendations, it would be about, you know, Senator Donnelly said 400 and something million. I think that's right. I think it's, and to do all of it, probably about a half a billion dollars. You know, we spend in Chapter 70 about 4 billion right now. Chapter 70, when it was completely implemented, took about seven years to get fully implemented. I'm hoping that's not how long uh, this Foundation Budget Review Commission goals get fully implemented, but they will happen over a few years, maybe three to four years. And so I think as legislators, and especially legislators representing the town of Arlington, we have to be keen on which areas of the commission's report uh, we try to implement first. And I would have one recommendation that I would uh, kind of an action step that I would re recommend the committee really uh, wrap their hand around it and really try to focus it. Obviously, we want the whole commission implemented uh, right away. You know, I do as well, and I would vote for the necessary revenue uh, to do that. Um, that's not going to happen. I'd be surprised if it happened. I'm certainly going to fight for it. But the specific area within the commission's recommendation is really around uh, special education, both out of district and in district. There's a number of recommendations that would increase the amount of revenue, amount of support to school districts across the Commonwealth for out of district and in district that I think makes a lot of sense. And if you look at each of the recommendations and the necessary revenue to implement these recommendations, it's pretty low level mm -hmm. um, stuff. Obviously, it's, it's money, it's a lot of money, but not in comparison to the rest of the recommendations. So I think that's a piece the legislature should tackle first. You know, other pieces in the, you know, in the commission's report are around, you know, health care costs, you know, um, the question of, um, you know, free and reduced lunch. There's a whole host of, of issues that I think we really need to wrap our, our mind around it. And, you know, 
I will say, as Senator Donnelly said, and I agree wholeheartedly with him, we need the revenue to do it. Uh, but the way uh, Chapter 70 was implemented over a seven-year period in the 90s was economic growth. Because as you remember, in the 90s, we made the unwise decision in the Commonwealth to do a number of t tax cuts. And that hurt our kids. But we were able to use that economic growth to invest in, in, our, in our kids through Chapter 70. We know it's an old formula. We know it doesn't work for the town of Arlington. That's what I've been saying on Beacon Hill for the past four terms. Um, but my hope is with the budget, with the review commission, that we can really get serious. Senator Donnelly mentioned there seems to be a disconnect with us in the corner office in terms of revenue uh, projections and the amount of revenue that's coming in. Our revenues are strong, you know, despite some concerns maybe in the future over capital gains tax revenue, but our revenue projections are strong. And I think we should use some of that economic growth for this purpose. And I think if we really want to be serious, this term, this year, that the House and the Senate will enact the changes on uh, in-district and out-of-district special ed, that will just mean more, more revenue for you. But I, I seriously want to do all the phases of the commission report. If you have recommendations that you'd like to see us tackle specific pieces beyond special education that you'd like to see us prioritize, please, please let us know. We work very closely together, you know, and, and we, we are very ideologically similar, uh, but we, you know, our priority is education. You know, for, for all three of us, me being on this committee, these are the kind of changes, you know, I remember being on the committee. Then it was Tuesday nights, but I remember being on the committee <laughs> with uh, Jeff and, and Paul and Kathy was here as the assistant superintendent, and, and just looking around and saying, you know, our hands are tied. We need the state to step up. And so that's one of the reasons I ran. And uh, this is an opportunity to do that, and an opportunity to bring some of that necessary, necessary revenue. So I'm excited about it, and I'd love to continue this dialogue uh, on here and on Beacon Hill on how we can get some of these recommendations passed. So Representative Rogers. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, and Superintendent Bodie. It's nice to be here. I would really echo what um, Sean and, and Ken said, the senator and the rep, and I, I benefit from their, from their wisdom and their um, uh, having gone first. <laughs> um, I assume most of you are familiar with report, so I, I won't go too deep into that. I'd say the methodology was pretty sound. I mean, there were a lot of experts a lot of advisors. I think uh, there were six um, hearings held around the state. So I think uh, this was done professionally. I think it's a, a, a very sound work product. Um, <clears throat> healthcare costs are a big driver. Uh, I think um, they're, um, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on numbers, but it's worth saying, I think um, healthcare costs is 140% higher. That's more than double. Think of that. That's eye-popping. And uh, not to go off on a tangent, but the, uh, the legislature passed a health care cost control bill, containment bill, in 2011-2012. 40% of the state budget goes to health care for Medicaid. Um, think of that. Four out of every $10 at the state level goes to health care. So one of the riddles is solving the explosion in the cost of health care. And, you know, that's, that's a, a longer problem. A longer-term problem. Um, I that healthcare cost containment bill. We'll see how it works over mm -hmm. some number of years. Um, special education costs, another big driver. English language learners. Those are the two biggies. And then there was a series of other ones: English language learners and other things that are driving um, these costs. And so, um, how will this be implemented? Um, you know, I think. Representative Garbley and Senator Donnelly make a good point. It, it will happen over time. Uh, as, as, as Sean pointed out, uh, the original 1993 law was about seven years in, in being implemented. I, I think this will be similar. There won't be one fell swoop. I think the um, consensus revenue just was announced at 4.3 percent this year. I think the governor made a pledge to always keep local aid growing at least as fast as, as that number. Uh, I believe that's his stated position. Yes. Um, um, 
And, and to, to Ken's point, you know, last year he, he came into office saying, oh, Deval Patrick, the former governor, left me a huge $768 billion uh, uh, deficit. That turned out to not be true, um, not be accurate. Um, now, to be fair, uh, to try to be fair to the governor, you know, <laughs> revenue at the state level is a moving thing. Like at the federal level, you can issue treasury bills, treasury bonds, and run a deficit. That's what we do at the federal level. We run big deficits. At the state level, you're always um, uh, making changes through supplemental budgets throughout the year. Um, but I think, as, 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 as Ken said, it's 400 and roughly $430 million to fully implement all of these changes. And that's a big number. I mean, that's a lot of money. So I think it is going to take – I, I kind of was curious, so I thought, well, what's $430 million? What does that mean? And that's almost the exact same amount as we budgeted for all of adult mental health services in the state uh, for, for this fiscal year. It's more than twice what we spend on environment and recreation programs, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. So I was trying to put that $430 million in perspective. It's a, it's a lot of money, and it, it's, uh, there are other things that are critical spending. Uh, obviously, we care hugely about, um, about education spending. So um, I was proud to co-sponsor, as, as did my colleagues, the amendment to get this study done. I think it is a sound work product. I think it's illuminated what a lot of us have wondered about for a long time. Uh, I will be fighting along with my colleagues to push for implementation. I think, you know, in the interest of being candid, it, it's not going to happen quickly. Uh, I, but I do think it will happen over time. And as many of you came to the forum, I think it was at, at, at the Thompson School, where we all participated. Um, there is a movement to amend the state constitution to uh, allow for progressive income taxation, that the highest, the ballot question reads, those with a million of income or more could mm -hmm. be taxed at a higher rate. And that would bring in about 1.9 billion of revenue targeted to education and transportation. And to be candid, I, I just don't know how we're going to get there unless something like that happens. Um, you know, uh, the speaker is on record. Money bills have to emanate or originate in the House. That's, that's the law. And the speaker has said no new taxes. Uh, that's in fitting with what the governor has said. You know, uh, I disagree. I wish we would look at revenue. Uh, the speaker has twice raised revenue during his tenure. Uh, in 2009, when the deficit, when the when the recession hit, and closed, we raised uh, state tax revenues, and um, uh, we did it again last year, uh, or I should say, in uh, 2013, we raised the gas tax, raised cigarette taxes. But if you're talking about a big income tax raise, which is frankly, that's that's where the money is, is in the income tax. I, I just don't see it, um, and and so. Um, I, would, I would vote for it, but a lot of my colleagues, I've got, you know, it's funny, it's been a revelation for me as I've gotten to know my colleagues in the House that um, many of them are deathly afraid of a revenue vote. And, 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 to, and just to finish that thought, in 2009, and, and Sean was there and Ken were there, there were members who lost, lost their seats because of their revenue vote. I just, I was out to dinner last night with a friend who, um, I said, tell me about your career in politics. And um, Representative Ash from, um, um, yeah. And he, um, he said, Dave, when, when, I voted, I, when I voted for that, I, I got beat up and I almost lost. So in this district, I think most of my constituents would support a revenue vote. There are colleagues I have who are hardworking public servants. They really want to do the right thing. They care about these issues, but a revenue vote for them is their career on the line. And, and I just have to say that because we have to be candid about, about the realities of the politics. So thanks for uh, listening and look forward to your I questions. One brief comment. Yeah, you too. So um, on top of what Representative Rogers said, and I think this is important, um, I don't disagree with anything he said except, you know, on, on this, you know, political will you know, is important. And um, to back up, uh, Representative Rogers mentioned the issue of the tax increase last session. Uh, I voted against it. So did Dave, or Representative Rogers. And so I think they should know that. And the reason we voted against it were twofold. One, it was completely inadequate. 
and very much aggressive. So I believe people in our, com in our commonwealth want to pay for essential services. But when they d see us take a tax vote, and then we find out it's not enough to cover what they believe in, what they have a passion for as an education, they get upset. And so I think we need to take a vote, um, you know, through our vote of voting no, because it was, it was too regressive, we need to take a vote that's regressive, that's, I'm sorry, that's pro progressive uh, and, and adequate. And so, you know, that's an important internal conversation that's happening in the State House. It's constantly happening and it will continue to. Um, so, you know, another, you know, quick thing in terms of what we will be battling, you know, we, we battle, you know, amongst priorities, uh, equal priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my goal is to try to get at least the special education recommendations on the commission report implemented. But another aspect that's a true passion for a lot of us is early ed. Mm -hmm. And we have not invested in pre-K in a number of years. And so there are a lot of people on Beacon Hill that want to focus on pre-K because we focused on higher ed two years ago. And so we find ourselves, you know, balancing all great things, which is why I think the needed revenue uh, is just so important and it can go for helping our economy and helping all of our cities and towns. So thanks for having us. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make another few comments. One, I won't support any of these proposals unless the money goes with it. Mm -hmm. I will not support any more unfunded mandates mm -hmm. to the schools. And two, uh, I will be strongly opposing as we debate. Uh, I don't see this being as part of the debate coming up in the next several months. I do see the expansion of charter schools as being part of the debate. I will not support increasing charter schools and taking money out of the, the school systems that we're trying to fight for now. We don't have enough money to, um, we, we, as you can see in this foundation report, there isn't enough money to educate our children in the public schools now. Taking more money out mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. productive. So I will be opposing any proposal in charter schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that that's a debate that we will be having mm -hmm. um, from, you know, I think before the end of this session. So it's, uh, I think it's one that all of the schools in the school community should take a hard look at. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful for the Senate's leadership on that issue over the past year. I, I, there, there's, I'm gonna open this up to the members, but I do wanna throw something on the table right now. There's a piece of paper ahead, uh, on our table that arrived tonight. <coughs> and the reason why I bring it up is the context is relevant to the conversation with the representatives. The town manager has come up with a number in his budget of $57,1,333 for fiscal 17, uh, which represents the fiscal 16 numbers plus a 3.5% increase for the remainder of the fiscal plan years of fiscal 17 through fiscal 22. That's Third, regular ed. Uh, that's, the that, regu that's the regular, regular ed number. Regular the, ed. So yeah, yeah that's regular. the regular ed. 35% yeah. of per pupil going forward for elementary growth. Which has been at 25. Uh, which has been at 25. A 10% differential applied to the past three years. And the reason why I'm bringing this up now, we'll discuss it uh, as the next agenda item, and the proposal will give the schools any extra Chapter 70 money that comes in over the, project, uh, the projections for the next few years. And the fiscal 17 projected increase is $126,000. So any money above $126,000 that's increased in the Chapter 70 budget will fall to the schools rather than uh, stay in the reserves for the stability plan. So understand that that constraint and offer is before us right now, which we will discuss, but it be, if, if this becomes the, the way we will be going forward, the Chapter 70 revenues become even more relevant. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I appreciate you talking about the unfunded mandates. The foundation budget formula did not take any account for the unfunded mandates. I would ask both houses, to strongly consider legislation controlling the Department of Education. They seem to be out of control. They come up with the unfunded mandates and dare you to, to oppose them. And it becomes, a, we are not a united front. 
if, if the 351 school departments and the individual communities stood up to the state or the Department of Education and said, no, fund it, we'll, we'll do it. But every time they, and you know this, I don't, I don't want to beat it, but I would ask you, uh, you're doing a heck of a job and I really appreciate you coming here, but you got, I don't mean to tell you your job, but you're in control of these people. And, and well, it's maybe easy for me to say, Ken, I, I, I appreciate that, but they seem to come off the mountain and after the fact, ask permission. That's the perception that, that we get. And uh, they're expecting us to Im implement it. Um, you, I, I think the auditor caught them on one, Kenny Vento, and I appreciate your, every one of your support on that. But that's one. And we get buried in these. You know that. I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, thank you. Well, I, I think uh, many of you know that you know, through the work of us and MASC, I filed a, a bill in the House to stop unfunded mandates and to look at all unfunded mandates and to, uh, to not bestow any more until that complete report is done. And, and we all supported that. And in addition to that was the mandate fingerprint for the, the background check. Mm -hmm. Both of those were, you know, big issues for it, us. Yeah, and, and Bill, uh, the administrative agencies, uh, most of them are under the governor. And it's very frustrating when we see regulations done by the administrative agencies because even though you say that we have control, we do not. And there are areas where, you know, to administ regulations are law, by the way, once they're implemented. Uh, and so it makes it very difficult for us as a, a legislature. When I was the chairman of state administration and regulatory oversight, it was extremely frustrating when we see some of the decisions made by these administration agencies, including Jesse, that, you know, um, it, it's, it becomes a, a piece that we have to change that regulation. Yes, let me just follow it up. Don't you control the funding of those agencies? Uh, well, not really, because that's uh, under the government. On the federal yeah. level, that when the, yeah. the regulation does come true, and they, they are administrated the same way. But if the legislature doesn't like it, they, they hold, you still hold the purse strings. And yeah. again, easy to we say. We won't get in a debate. A and F does control I, the fine, but that's okay. Okay, that's all right. Go ahead. Mr. Pierce? Well, I don't, I don't know if we all appreciate or, or uh, how lucky we are to have a delegation who stands behind what we do here uh, and what our students are doing every day in the classroom. So thank you all for, for coming and sharing what's going on at the State House with us. Uh, I wanted to echo something that uh, Representative Garbley said about the, the pre-K um, and how some parents here in our community uh, are different than in other communities like Cambridge, like Somerville, in that they have to uh, really fund an extra year of uh, pre-K and there's no um, pre-K offered uh, by the town for them. So I think that's a disservice to some of the residents in our community. And it would be great if the state could, could acknowledge that and, and try to do something about that. Um, but uh, that, that's, that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Starks? So um, I have a question of a different sort. Um, on the 2016 ballot, we know that marijuana legalization is on there as well. Um, and looking at what's happened in Colorado and the amount of money that they've been bringing in just on the taxes alone, um, I'm interested in understanding best, because I feel like it's kind of a done deal, what we could do with that money. Where Are, are people starting to think about how we can direct the monies from that, because that I feel like is probably some short-term money, or at least it's shorter than the constitutional amendment, because if it passes, which looks like it probably is going to, um, that money is coming in sooner rather than the even, even the constitutional amendment. So interested in kind of understanding if, if there have been discussions about where that might go, how that might be earmarked, um, and of course, if we could, if education could get a piece of that. Yeah, um, Cindy, thank you for the question. I'm on the Senate committee to look at um, what happens if the uh, Constitution Amendment passes. And they, uh, there's a group of my colleagues that are out in Colorado right now. I passed yeah, I on the that. trip. Yeah. But I'm on that committee. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at all of the aspects of how and what will happen. And part of that will be the funds, the monies and where, that, where the monies will go. 
So yeah, we'll be, we'll be looking at that. We'll be doing a report and uh, I will make sure that we specifically look at what type of revenue has been brought in in Colorado and what we do with that revenue. Yeah, because I would love to know how, what right. they're doing with it and how they're dealing with it. It's, but my, my understanding is it's been quite a lot of money, quite a boost to their state coffers. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Mr. Thielman. So thank you for coming. Always good to see you guys here. Uh, the, uh, I just, you, you know this, but I want to say this. The enrollment in the town of Arlington is increasing substantially over the next several years. And uh, we're in a dialogue, right? That's the best way to describe it, with the, <clears throat> the town manager and town leaders about how much money is going to be in the school department budget for next year. Uh, we asked for quite a bit of uh, an increase. Um, and I'm not sure that we're going to get as much as we'd like. And so I appreciate the fact that, you know, it took seven years to implement the Chapter 70 uh, formula the last time. But, and I, and I know you know this, but I just want to say this publicly while we're all here together. It's important that you advocate uh, because your role in trying to help us respond to this enrollment increase is to try to get that Chapter 70 money uh, up and to the town of Arlington as fast as possible. I mean, because when you're advocating at the state level, um, I know you represent other cities and towns, but they're, they're seeing actually enrollment increases too, I think. And so this area, this region of the state is seeing enrollment increases, and we need to see that Chapter 70 money get to us sooner rather than later. Um, so I just, I just want to emphasize that. I want you to just be reminded of that. The next time you come, I'll probably say the same thing, because uh, not getting that money uh, as quickly as we'd like, is, it hurts us. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact uh, some of the things that we probably aren't going to be able to do next year in the school district. So I'll leave it at that. So, no, I think, uh, as I said earlier in my statement, that I'm seeing it in all my districts, all my communities, that uh, people decide to move to Arlington for a reason. Because there's really good quality schools, same as Lexington. And I think in, in an economic development aspect of it, we need to make sure that we can attract good quality, uh, you know, employees, employers to our area. And the way to do that is to invest in our school system. So um, we're with you 100%. Yeah, I would just say, you know, Jeff, I think you're absolutely right. And it's kind of it's kind of sad because we've been saying the same things for a long time, but now it really matters. It matters. Because so. we're facing uh, such a conversation that's really going to end up hurting our schools if Chapter 70 increases don't come in. So. We're all on board. Um, advocacy is something that this delegation, I, I think, does very, very well. I think it's certainly one of the reasons the MSBA staff recommended to the board that we rebuild Arlington High School. Very shortly after MSBA and the town of Arlington, a committee we were on, Jeff, to redo the Thompson. So, you know, we'll continue to, to advocate and uh, try to make it a priority for not just this budget, but for next budget, too, and try to get it done quicker than seven years. But I think implementing it, like doing special ed and trying to do it, you know, within the next couple of years, but trying to get it done as quickly as possible is something that's important. But the revenue needs to be behind it, and you know, you have that support, but you also have the advocacy too. So, thank you very much for your comments and uh, for your leadership. And I'd, I'd also quickly add that you know, um, and yeah, thanks for the, the question. Um, as, as as Sean and I know, every year, and I probably have mentioned this to you before, um, members, each of the members are invited to meet one-on-one -on -one with the chairman of Ways and Means. Um, happens to be Brian Dempsey right now. And we're allowed to pick three line items or three things that we would advocate for. <laughs> to be fair to him, you can imagine if 160 <laughs> members each had 10 or 15 priorities, it would get out of control pretty quickly. And um, uh, I'm in my fourth year now, and in each of my first three years as I sit um, admiring the office of the Chair of Ways and Means, I, uh, and his fireplace, his working fireplace, I, one of my three is always Chapter 70 Education Fund, always. It always has been. Unless things change radically, it always will be. So I am fighting, fighting, fighting for more money for our schools they are. Uh, so important, as, as both Ken and Sean have said, to this community, these outstanding schools. It's why people move here. Um, it's it's 
uh, perhaps a cliche to say so, but I'll say it anyway, you know, education is our future, particularly as the world grows more competitive, uh, not just competing with other states, but really with, uh, in a global economy. So um, it's, it's always going to be my priority. Are we only supposed to do three? Is that true? <laughs> I've never kept that rule. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> um, yeah, actually, I, I thought I'd just sort of step back and, and sort of talk about why you guys are here. So um, just to, for the benefit of the viewers at, um, at home. Um, 1993, education reform, they established sort of a picture of what a school looked like and how much it would cost to fund such a school. Uh, a lot changed since 1993, and I know that uh, you guys were partly instrumental in pushing for this foundation re budget review that we got last year to say, wait a second, it doesn't cost what it cost in 1993, but let's see what it really does cost. And as I understand, that review was a very careful process, lots of committees, lots of meetings. Um, they came up with actually some fairly conservative numbers. There's more that they could have put in that they left out. Um, but then what sort of we all saw, saw is, okay, now we know that the old numbers were wrong, and those were, are what Chapter 70 money is based on, and the new numbers are really this. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> you know, uh, we know that we are not getting the new numbers, and so what, what do we as school committee members, what do we as citizens, what should we push for? And so I think one of the reasons we want to invite you here is to figure out, like, what should our role be? And, I, and I've heard actually two competing proposals, um, and I actually want to throw out maybe a third. One is to push for specific, particular pieces of that, and another is maybe to push for percentages of, of the amount, 25% or some other number um, rolled out each, each year or something. Um, and I wonder, and, and let me throw out a, a third idea which may not be practical. Um, I wonder, I know you've, you guys have mentioned a few times that the governor has some numbers and that don't quite pan out when everything comes in. Revenue actually is better than he anticipated. And I wonder if there's any way to sort of <coughs> constrain that so, th so that when we do get the real numbers, and, and if, as we expect, they look better than the predictions that the governor is making right now, if some portion of that could be set aside to fund this gap in the um, Chapter 70 funding. I don't know, I don't know if that's a realistic. Well, we have, what we're going to have is we're going to have the governor come out with his proposal, then it goes to the House and then the Senate, and um, we won't get into, if there's a real difference, we won't get into that until we do the year-end closing, which will be next year, right. and it's, uh, when, you, when you start getting at that point, we need to get the money up front. Right. We need to start the debate, and so what can you do? Mm -hmm. What we need to do is we need to let the governor know let the uh, speaker know and the Senate president, the big three, that um, we need to make sure that we raise the revenues needed uh, to fund Chapter 7 proper, properly. We need to do that politically. Until uh, enough people get on that and, and start saying that we don't mind paying more revenue to make sure that our, uh, we invest in our future, um, we're not going to be able to do it. Right. It's, it's plain right. and simple. If you look at our budget and if you look at um, the, you know, our, how we balance it, uh, we've already gone through an early retirement incentive where a lot of agencies right now are depleted. Right. And um, we know what happened with DCF. We know what happened with, uh, you know, some of the other agencies, uh, your criminal justice system, your courts. Your, I can get down the whole list. And so that if anybody can tell you that, that by getting rid of waste abuse, that's the, you probably hear the same thing. If we get rid of all the abuse in the school system, we'll be fine. Well, you know, I'm, I'm still looking to see that list of where we have wasted or where we're Eternal wasting justice. money and where we have <laughs> extra money. It really comes down to we have to make sure that we do a good job of letting the people know that we need the revenues to, to do what we need to do. And until we do that, we won't get them. There's no, there's no magic formula. Actually, can I ask a question? Um, I know Sean wants to say something. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the timeline of the um, ballot proposal to change the Constitution to allow for a differentiated income. So I know that it's a very long timeline. It has to go, it's, it has to be constitutionally changed. Right. So this year, 
Uh, it has to come up at a constitutional convention, which is the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and we need, I think, a 50 votes? 50, 50 votes uh, to uh, push it to next session. So we have to do it in two successive sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do it, hopefully we do it this spring. Mm -hmm. Then next year we do it, we have two years to do it in that next session, and then it would be on the ballot for- 18? 2018. 2018. 2018. Okay. And then if it's on the ballot for 2018, you can, and it passes, you can start raising revenue in 2019. Is that, is that right? Is that sort of what? I start raising revenue. So. Fiscal 2020. Fiscal 2020. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. So, um, to answer your question, um, the school committee member Seuss, um, you know, in terms of what our collective priorities should be for coming up with this next budget debate. So the governor will be coming out with his budget very shortly, and then the House prepares their budget to be debated, usually on school, you know, the week after school vacation in April. And then the Senate follows suits, suit in May. And so the process of advocacy, as Rep. Rogers stated, you know, will be happening very, very soon for the House. You know, we will be going in very soon. Um, I'm on Ways and Means, so is Senator Donnelly. Um, and you know, this will certainly be our top priority. But you asked a very specific question. You know, should we be advocating for the whole thing, pieces, percentages? Um, you know, I certainly will be advocating for the whole thing. You know, as, as Jeff had mentioned, you know, this is money that our district needs now, so we'll be advocating for the whole thing. I would not prepare as a policymaker for the town of Arlington that the whole thing will get implemented this year. So, you know, part of our partnership with you uh, is, you know, through your superintendent, assistant superintendent, and CFO sitting over here is what do you think <coughs> our priorities should be in, in, in moving forward in terms of implementing this? You know, obviously you want it implemented at once, but if we can't, would you like us to implement the special ed? Would you like us, you know, which, you know, and this is a conversation, we don't need any answers now because there probably aren't any. But we'll have to come back to this table uh, when the revenue pictures are a little more clearer and we know what the governor budget looks like because he's, he may have a couple of recommendations to the budget review, review commission uh, suggested. I don't know. Um, but, you know, our conversation will uh, matriculate as the budget season goes on. But my priority is to implement this thing as quickly and as comprehensively as possible. But I hope our you know, relationship and our, our working partnership, you know, we can, you know, come up with a path of advocacy that you think as, as elected leaders of Arlington will help uh, your school system in the town uh, the most. So we do, you know, we have a shared priority and have to have a shared vision in terms of the advocacy role. But our advocacy, you know, we're, we, we want this thing to get implemented as quickly as possible. That's why we co-sponsored it, you know, because we, we want this to happen. <laughs> um, so I have to say that as much as I love the idea of funding pre-K, that scares me because I think, where on earth would we put kids? <laughs> you know, because Arlington is stretched to the gills. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's a great idea educationally, but right now for Arlington, yeah. I don't know how we'd make it work. Yeah. Uh, First, I want to thank all of you for the work you're doing to talk to uh, SBA regarding Arlington High School. Uh, they've been in the building. They've seen the critical need. You've been very effective at communicating that. and The community needs to know that, that you've been working on this behind the scenes. Um, David Driscoll has mentioned you guys uh, specifically because of your frequent mentions of Arlington High School. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, I said Arlington, he said, oh yeah, your high school project. Um, uh, the, the story is, we talk about how it took seven years to implement, fully implement Chapter 70. But when we got to that seven year point around 2000, 2001, this is when it started to erode. And it was a very sneaky erosion because what they did was they underinflated the cost of delivering the service. And the way the formula is calculated, they calculate how much the community can afford relative to that foundation budget, and then the state funds the rest. And if you underestimate the 
cost of providing the education, what gets reduced is the mandatory state contribution. So they're saying they're fully funding Chapter 70 by the formula, but if you're underinflating the cost of providing the education, uh, it, it's just technical. And this erosion was constant except for fiscal 2004. I believe Mr. Garbley was on the committee that year when Governor Romney cut our Chapter 78 20%. It took us like about eight years to recover from that point to get where we were in fiscal 03, which was level funded from 02. So there's been many years since we were fully funded of uh, erosion of Chapter 70 funding and we need to get back. And for that reason, I'm very frustrated when the House leadership is saying that uh, revenue is off the table because last Thursday we had a meeting in Town Hall ably led by Dr. Seuss because we have some really critical issues facing us as a community. And she organized this big, beautiful event because we want everything on the table, including the one suggestion to build in the middle of Spy Pond. <laughs> Uh, we're willing to entertain every solution. And when push comes to shove, if the legislature is not making the hard decisions, it gets pushed down to the local level. And I know you guys understand this, but I really would like you to take back from this room tonight that local officials who are faced with the prospect of not being able to meet the expectations in terms of services from the community because we don't have the authority to raise revenue. You do. You could vote tomorrow to raise revenue when it is. We can't do that. We're constrained by all the revenue restrictions imposed by Prop 2 and a half and everything else within the state law. Municipalities in this, common, in this Commonwealth are more restricted than municipalities, I think, in any other state in terms of our ability to raise revenue locally. So we're stuck, we can't raise the revenue, the state won't. And that needs, that needs to be fixed somehow. Either give us the authority to do the work that the state doesn't want to do, or have the state step in and do the right thing in terms of raising revenue. One of the things we had when we went to see Barney Frank, uh, when we were lobbying for schools from MASC, First thing out of his mouth, are you supporting increased revenue? Don't talk to me unless you're willing to stand with me for more taxes. And I think that uh, the, the message that we've had in conversations is that we will stand behind you if you are doing the difficult task of making sure that we have adequate revenue to provide services. Because the choice is either we raise it through the income tax or we have to go and raise it through property taxes, which are far more regressive. A couple of other things to mention. Park. We're going to park electronic next, uh, uh, and paper this year. We're going to MCAS 2.0 uh, all electronic in a couple of years. The, the criticism that was coming back on park through the whole consortium is Massachusetts lag behind every other state in terms of the technology available in the schools to implement electronic te testing. We're supposed to be the high-tech state, and we're lagging behind everybody else. And we cannot afford to do this on a local basis, to infuse the schools with technology. If the state is making initiatives, which is a good initiative, to go to electronic testing, that's the way we should be going. The state needs to fund this because we may have trouble doing it. There are a lot of other districts who are going to have a lot more trouble. There needs to be a constant technology initiative in terms of education funding because the foundation budget was established in 1993 when there was no technology in the schools. That's another essential. Uh, thank you for your discussion on charter schools because that is an unfunded mandate. The state goes and places them in communities and garnishes our Chapter 70 account for them. I have no problem with charter schools. I have problems with the funding. And I thank you for standing tall on that. Um, 
I could go on forever. I won't. Uh, thank you for coming. We have you have an open invitation for coming back anytime you have something to say to us. Anytime you want the cameras in, in this meeting and the conversation with us, we are happy to have you here, and we appreciate the work you're doing. Great. And it's likewise, Thank too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Certainly appreciate all the hard work that each, all seven of you, and, and staff that, that make this school system a great one. Mm -hmm. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I can get on a rent on that pretty easily. Um, so now we get to that piece of paper I referenced earlier, which is the uh, offer from the town manager and what he is thinking about for his budget. And I'm going to pass this over to Superintendent Bodie. Well, I, I do want to mention that I, I just received these numbers late this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, the town manager has been working very hard in uh, preparing his budget, which is due tomorrow. The one thing, though, I, I failed to put in this because it wasn't a change, but I do want to mention it. We are still going to have the 7% increase with special education, so I will amend this. But this really sort of represents a, a difference in what our current funding will be. The one the reason why the 3.5% 3, increase for the remainder of the plan years from 17 to 22 is different is that uh, what the plan had been is that this year we would go down to 3.25% and then next year 3%. So this represents um, a, a change to the positive for our budget. Um, as I think it was um, Ms. Seuss, Dr. Seuss uh, mentioned, the 35% or maybe it's uh, uh, Ms. Starks, this year we've had a 25, actually the last three years for, in the way of funding, we have had 25% of per pupil um, to recognize the cost of additional enrollment in the schools. And that percent change is going to go up 10% to 35% this year and the out years to, of the plan. But there'll be a, the, th the difference between the 25 and the 35, the 10% differential, uh, will be applied to the to the pupils that we have gained over the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, the issue of having some recognition that this isn't what we wanted in the way of a budget increase, but should Chapter 70 go up beyond the predictions that we have for the FY17 budget, that those monies would come directly to the schools. So the net increase uh, for FY17 is $973,500. Sorry about that. <laughs> Didn't see the $973,000, uh, $524. That represents a 6.4% increase over uh, this year. Uh, but as you know, the work we have been doing um, as an administration team is really looking at what it is that we feel is necessary to provide the services that this community has continued and, and expects from its school system. Um, we did a very careful analysis of this in terms of the different asks that we had in terms of how it affected enrollment growth or um, the, the needs of closing the achievement gap, and we had, and you have a copy of that um, from the last time, as, as well as, oh, and curriculum materials, as well as the rationale for every single increase that we've been looking for. That total is in, is in far in excess of what um, we, are, we are going to be um, offered for next year. And that total was $3,872,980. Pardon? Oh, you have the number? I have the okay. number. Um, I can tell you how much this, I got, you, the, I got, the, got it by email as I was in my other meeting, so I was able to do some quick calculations. Okay. We will be able, including $250,000 yeah. coming out of our reserve, we will be able to take $1,529,278 of the 3.8 million 
dollars worth of things we need. Say that number again. One million. One million. Yep. Five hundred twenty-nine thousand. Okay. Two hundred and seventy-eight. Okay. Oh, so you've added. To That's the including all of our revenue projections from our prior yep. sheets. Uh, the uptick from the town, the difference between what we were expecting and what they're now offering, is seven hundred and eighty-six thousand four ninety-seven. So that was on top of what they had. We had previously planned in the long range plan. So the 973 is the uptick. Plus That's the a difference from the prior, prior year prior, to this. Plus, so, so our previous expectation increase plus the uptick or something like that. that it's the total difference between what we're getting this year and what they're yeah, going to give us next yeah, okay. year. But what um, Diane is saying is that embedded uh, in our revenue projections that we gave you. We, we had expected the three and a quarter percent. Right. So this is uh, a slight change up. So it does, even though this is the differential, it really doesn't represent the true difference in terms of uh, what we expected right. in terms of what we can apply to next year. Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Mr. Hainer. Just uh, before, before we get started, let me just say, because this is new information for us tonight, we're not going to vote anything on this, but this is a first discussion, and we'll have this on the agenda for the next meeting, and we'll get more documentation. Mr. Hainer. Uh, just a clarification, I just need, from what was just said, uh, Ms. Johnson indicated uh, a figure, and that the, with the increased revenue, we're gonna be able to put in more, more of the requests than we, had we were able a while back. Am I overstating it? We made um, we made three point eight million dollars, roughly speaking, in requests that we felt were essential services. Right. And of that, based on what the town manager has offered, according to my calculations, we will be able to afford one million five hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars of the three point eight million dollars. So, yes. Pri prior to this offer, it would have been less. It would have been about eight hundred thousand dollars less. So. We picked up eight hundred thousand. About a half a million dollars. We picked up about eight hundred thousand dollars. Eight hundred thousand dollars. Just that's the information mm -hmm. I want. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The discussion and vote later. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Pierce. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just missing. Uh, no, it's okay. I'm sorry. Why I'm just, we're why we're picking up eight hundred, but they're saying we're picking up nine seventy three. Mm -hmm. The difference the difference is is that some of the money, there was a f former long range plan where they were going to give us some uptick from the prior year. Yep. The 900000 is the total uptick from the prior year to this year with the new offer. Okay. So the seven hundred, the, the seven eighty six is the difference from what they were already offering us. And oh, this, I see. this is on top. Okay. Sorry to be a bummer. <laughs> Mr. Thielman. Well, I, uh, uh, Ms. Starks. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so my, I, my questions were, as I was doing the math, so the additional $800,000. So we are somewhere around basically able to fund 39% of the asks that we have. It's about 39%. It was a third before I found out it was 1.5, when it was only 1.279. It was exactly a third. But um, now it's like 39%. So um, my... Concern is kind of uh, is there other monies in the revolving accounts that we can use to bolster this? Um, do we simply go back to everyone who asked and tell them they have to trim it down to a third of their ask so that they can prioritize? How do we move forward? Dr. Bowie. We have $3.8 million in asks and $1.5 million to. All right. Mm -hmm. We had started to begin that process because we were fairly confident that we were not going to be able to have the uh, dollar amounts that we requested. And uh, from work yesterday, we were able to identify eight, uh, roughly about 800,000. My suggestion is that you task us with going back and really looking at this um, over the next two weeks. Uh, but I also want to hear uh, this evening what are priorities that you have as a committee and is there anything that wasn't represented in what we had. Uh, but I think it's helpful to know your thoughts as we go through this process. As we look at this, there are some things that are absolutely essential. Uh, the curriculum materials have been somewhat neglected, neglected, 
over the last few years in, in order to maintain funding of classrooms, teachers in classrooms, teachers in support services. But we have reached a critical stage where we have to do that. So th that is a high priority, and, and we, I think that with taking money out of the revolving account, uh, that is one-time revenue, it's, and that would be an appropriate place to, to <coughs> use that. But I think our revenues have grown sufficiently that we feel comfortable with that amount of money, perhaps a tiny bit more. Um, but also, the, the issue for us is enrollment growth, and we have, we don't know exactly what, how many new teachers we're going to need and where they're going to be, except in one place, and that's at Thompson. And we can talk about the uh, decision that was made at the task force in terms of recommendation town meeting uh, uh, this evening, but sort of talking a little bit ahead on that, the recommendation was that we we um, fund two modular classrooms at Thompson next year. And if you fund two modular classrooms, you have to staff those classrooms. Mm -hmm. So that would be two teachers that for sure would be on our list of reserve teachers. But there's going to be other increases. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, when we look at Audison next year, while the number of new students coming in Comparing the fifth to sixth grade, it's probably we'll get another 20 or 30 students. But the class that's leaving in the eighth grade is in the mid threes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be seeing, in terms of servicing uh, service to our students next year, a lot more students in the building, mm -hmm. and in the, in the neighborhood of 80 students in that vicinity. So it's a lot of students that we're going to have to address. So that is another area we feel that we're going to have to. Uh, put some of this money. And those are the, the big ones. We also have a few positions we need to look at and partial positions in the high school. But then we're going to have to take a really hard look. Um, w one, of the, the, one of the things that I know we've, you, you're very well aware of and we've talked about here at the table many times is that one of our goals as a district and it is to close the achievement gap. It is certainly not only our goal, it is also a mandate. And the state judges in terms of levels, whether we are a level of a school and the level of a school district, how well we are able to meet the targets for performance, not only for all of our students, but for our students in high needs group. And those are students that have learning disabilities, <coughs> Um, our low socioeconomic uh, students and ELL students. And in order to provide the kind of support they need to achieve well, it requires interventions. And it requires interventions on, on many fronts, uh, not, not only read academic, but social emotional, uh, special, educa special education supports. And a lot, of, in fact, if you look at the list we had, and we, we went through each one of the asks and, and looked to see whether it addressed it enrollment growth or um, closing the achievement gap, the curriculum, everything on there is at least one. If most of them are two or even three in terms of what we're using the money to address. So we're gonna, the, the lens that we will look at in a recommendation back to you uh, will be the lens of closing the achievement gap. Um, but, is, but having said that, there are enrollment pressures that we are going to have to address. You know, we, we have to look at the, the staffing at the middle school for sure next year. That is, and in past years, frankly, we have put more of the reserve positions at the elementary level to keep class sizes down than we have put money into the secondary level. And I think next year, the most pressing uh, area of our school system is the middle school. So it's going to be, it's going to take a lot of discussion, a lot of thought, um, and um, some very, very hard decisions as we go forward. But I'd love to hear, and I, I, I know the rest of us would like to hear very much, your thinking on all of this as well. Laura. If I might, just before you go on, I just want to clarify, because it would, 
If it was just a matter of taking 30, you know, people asking people to take their ass down 33%, um, it might not be as painful as this process is going to be. But I need to call to your attention the things about enrollment pressures that Dr. Bodhi just talked about. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the teachers, the two teachers at Thompson, um, and the teachers that we absolutely have to add at the middle school because of those 80 new students, mm -hmm. basically the amount of money that's left is significantly less than asking people to cut theirs down 33%. Um, because you know, you're, you're only left with a couple hundred thousand dollars once you start looking at five reserve positions plus the positions that are necessary at the middle school. So I just wanted to call that to your attention. It, 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 it would be pa painful enough if we were at going back to people and asking them to cut it by 33%. But once we take out the money that we know we have to spend on reserve positions and the positions at the middle school, it's significantly less than that. So, said thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. So, when we talked about the $3.872 million increase, were we, were we talking about, uh, just, I mean, I think, refresh my memory and maybe the public's memory, it was to maintain the services we have. I mean, that's really what we talked about. Didn't we talk about that? That yep. seems to be mm -hmm. the rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the, the fact of the matter is that it's $2.3 million, $2.34 million less than we would like, so we're not going to be maintaining the services we have. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first thing that we have to just acknowledge, mm -hmm. unless we want to take a different political tact. And the first thing you have to do is um, you have to staff to enrollment. I mean, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. you know fundamental responsibility of school management. You've got to, so, so you've got to staff to enrollment. There's a, a legal mandate to close the achievement gap. And we've, we've, made a, we've had a lot of conversations here about 20-year-old curriculum materials and wanted to update them. So when you do those three things, I mean, I don't have the budget in front of me. Mm. I just got the, this number tonight. That's about, two, that's about $2.7 million. Yeah, so to do that, so it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a question of priorities. It's really, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's being framed the right way here. I think the question is, after you do what we're supposed to do, staffing to enrollment, um, achievement gap, Curriculum materials, what's left? Well, if in order to do those three things, we would need significantly more money than we've been given. Yeah, okay. So, so we're not even going to meet We're not even going to do that. Yeah, so we can't have a, so it's a, not a priority discussion. It That's is. That's unrealistic to call it that. Can't yeah. frame it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, I think it's, so I mean, it, <clears throat> so I think it's, a, I think it's a. <laughs> it's a, what can we absolutely least live without? Yeah. And, and, you know, there's no question that this will put upward pressure on class size. There's absolutely right. no different, you know, there's, in terms of, maintaining the kind of um, interventionist services we need for the struggling students that's not going to be as rich. We're, we're not going to be able to do what we've done this year. Yeah. So I guess the other question I have is, is there, is there any other, uh, I mean, are there other options politically besides accepting this uh, decision? Mr. Hainer. I think there is one. We say we are the educate. We are responsible for the education in this town. I've said it before. We don't accept it. I appreciate everything they've done. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good, a good faith effort. But from what I'm hearing from our, from our our administration, we have no right to do anything but support the budget that they brought in. If it's maintaining, if it's asking for something new. No, I'm, that's my position. The cut may have to happen, but it should not come from us because we've been we've been elected to represent education. The town tells us to cut, and they're not going to give us all the money. They're going to cut us by the difference. Then we have to do it. We should be prepared for it. I understand that, and I'm not suggesting wait till that, that time. But I'm, I do appreciate what they've done, and I do appreciate the increase. But at the same time, I've said it twice. That's enough. Thank you. Dr. Seuss. Oh, I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Alice Ampe, who's not here, who was instrumental in sort of getting the ball rolling to start this conversation. So if we have to accept these numbers, it's very dire. But the numbers we had before mm -hmm. were beyond dire. They were mm -hmm. absolutely de devastating. So um, I hope there's ways to push for more. But I, I just wanted to give a shout out to her, I think, mm -hmm. her efforts, um, and to thank her for that. Uh, Dr. Bode. I think that the conversation you had this evening with our representatives was important um, because one of the, one of the um, offers in this is that any money that comes in for Chapter 70 will come directly to the schools above what the projection number was. So I, the, the, 
the work that they're doing in the state house is really going to affect us very directly. Unfortunately, um, the way the state sets up their budget process, they don't come to a budget number until sometimes May. And I've, I've known years where they've gone into June or even July. And of course, you know, for a school district in terms of getting money, you, you then you have to sort of think about how, when, when and if, if, if it looks like it's going to come, how you, you manage all that. But having said that, if we were to get extra Chapter 70 money even that late, we certainly could use it to support both um, interventions, supporting our students that most need it, and, and, and addressing class sizes. And one way we may only be able to address some large class sizes next year is through more t teaching assistant help. Uh, but that is something that we could do in the summer as well. Mr. Hainer again. Dr. Ampey uh, asked me, I was going to save this for the but, uh, <clears throat> committee reports, but I think it's to remain now. Request from committee members to develop a list of concerns for the budget subcommittee to use in setting the priorities. Mm -hmm. So she asked me to pass that mm -hmm. on to all of us. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Uh, we go to next item on the agenda, monthly financial. Oh, we were going to put that off. We, we are going to put that off. I, I, I'm calling it just to, okay. to get the explanation on the table of why we're putting it off. Well, we had a recent resignation in the business office mm -hmm. that is impacted just getting the work done, and so we just need a little bit more time on that. Okay, okay superintendent's report. <clears throat> All right, um, a few things. I'd like to talk a little bit about the task force, and I know that we have three members of the task force here as well mm -hmm. this evening, and of course, um, Dr. Seuss has been attending these as, as well. This is the building task force. This the is the school enrollment. The enrollment. School enrollment. enrollment. I'm, I'm sorry. It's the, yes, it's yeah. the school enrollment task force that has been meeting on uh, d developing recommendations for space options for our schools. Mm -hmm. The conversation at this at the task force has really been focused on the last couple meetings as to the immediate decisions about for Thompson for next year and the uh, task force had requested a number of reports from from me um, relative to so thinking about are there only is the only option that we have for Thompson to add modular classrooms next year could there be other ways that we could address the issue and they range from could we bus a class from Thompson to another school that had some capacity and looked at the cost there. If you had two buses and you did the monitors and the support that would be needed, it would be around 183000 um, You could get a lesser amount if you did two runs, but then that cr creates a lot of time issues as well. We looked at the possibility of you know, doing redistricting of the whole town, of the town, basically five out of the seven. But even if you did redistricting, it would not affect next year because that, it, that's a process. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a process that we would have to engage in that would take at least a year if we're going to get uh, input. So that would be off the table, at least for looking at next year. And, and then we also looked at the possibility, could we create one Thompson-Hardy school district in which, um, you know, basically we looked at the total number of students at each grade and see if there was economy of scale of, uh, you know, combining them and then breaking them apart into more even class sizes. And actually turned out not to be the case. In fact, if you stayed at the average of 23 per class for the, the upper grades, three through five, and 22 for the lower grades, you would re actually need another classroom. Um, if you went to 24 across the board as your average class size, then you could actually pick up three classrooms. <coughs> but the, the level of disruption mm -hmm. with all of this, um, I think we, I, I think that it became very clear that all of these options were problematic, mainly in terms of the, the total disruption to families' lives and separating the a, a part of the community of Thompson out for the year because we don't simply know what 
what the long-term solution is going to be there. And that is something the committee has to address going forward. But anyway, I, I can say to those listening and who haven't been able to be there, the committee has looked at every possible option for thinking about how we do the short-term uh, solution at Thompson. And so I, the, what the process will be now is that that recommendation will um, go to town meeting. There will be a finance committee next meeting next week to, to talk about what the, 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 the monies are involved in that. Um, right now, we think that that cost could be around 400000 but as we be looking at that over the next week, see if we can fine tune that a little bit more. So that is where we are with respect to the immediate issue with Thompson, but the committee is going to take up uh, the issue of, of Otteson, which I think everyone feels is really the big issue facing us in terms of long-range planning. And uh, that the next meeting of the task force is February 23rd. In, in the meantime, we'll have some meetings here of our facilities committee, and I don't know if, if, if the other members of the task force want to make any further comments uh, about how we're proceeding. It's uh, certainly the questions being asked, the reports being asked for in terms of looking this are very comprehensive, and um, I feel good about the recommendation that was made the other night for well, next year. Let me start with Mr. Thielman. Well, I, yeah, I think Kathy uh, summed up uh, the whole process we're in so far. I mean, the the, <clears throat> the committee voted affirmatively for two classrooms at Thompson. That addresses immediate need there for the 2016-2017 school year. Left open the question of uh, the need for a permanent addition of five to six classrooms at the Thompson School for the 2017-28 school year and beyond. Uh, the committee, some members of the committee don't want to revisit this until the fall, until we have more definitive numbers from the actual enrollment in the fall of 2016. Uh, some of us want to keep the conversation going and are hoping that we can introduce, that we want to talk about it again with the enrollment task force, and we're still hopeful that we can try to propose something at town meeting in the fall, in the April. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that happened was that the, I think they want, to, want us to come back with a recommendation on a num uh, you know, how much it would cost for an architect to do an assessment of the, uh, mm -hmm. do a kind of a preliminary analysis of the Addison. Mm -hmm. So we're tasked, yeah. Kathy is, we're, we're tasked with mm -hmm. kind of finding out what it cost and reporting back on February mm -hmm. 20, 23rd, what, what it would cost to do an assessment of the Addison. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of the various options. We know of the, what was just, just the Addison. Okay. That was it. Uh, and then the other thing is that one, you know, some a member of the committee, one of the member of the public, got up at the end and said, you know, you've got, you've, you still haven't made a decision about the Gibbs, mm -hmm. and the committee needs to talk about the Gibbs and come back mm -hmm. and tell us what you're going to do with the Gibbs, and so we need to do that at some point. I don't know what, the, what your, what do you think the timeline is for coming back with the Gibbs? Well, I know that they would like a decision much sooner than June. In fact, uh, there's been an outreach of a board member to me and uh, the director to the town manager. The, the issue they face is, one, finding alternative spaces, and that's not easy in this area. Secondly, um, it's important for their families to know mm -hmm. long-range plans. So June, well, that is our, we have a legal right to wait until June. Mm -hmm. It's it's. They would prefer a decision much sooner than that, and even February may be a little late. But this is Leslie Ellis. This is Leslie Ellis. Yeah. Yes, the Leslie. I'm sorry. The yeah. Les, I should have said mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But so, I think that uh, certainly the other tenants would like to know too, because mm -hmm. in the same in the same vein, they have to find alternate space. Mm -hmm. One thing that we know from conversations and the comments that were made at the January 7th meeting is that there's a strong um, desire on the part of parents and community members to know that if if the Arts Council and if the theater is mm -hmm. has to be uh, dislodged from Gibbs, mm -hmm. what are we going to do about space for those mm -hmm. groups? Dr. Seuss. Oh, I, I have a couple questions that comment, but just one question is who's funding the uh, furniture that we need for the two extra costumes? Is that something that we can, that town meeting could vote for, including in that number? 
because it has to come to our budget, then we're even more constrained. True. Sure. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. So is there any ways that we can get, when we go to town meeting on the 25th, that we can roll in the furniture costs or with all of the costs. Or, yeah, all those sort all of set up the classroom, exactly. the setting up the classroom costs with the um, rental or purchase of the modulars. That is something that we po we certainly can do. Um, we also could think about funding some of it out of our facilities, and we could also take a look if, if it's a short-term solution to see what furniture we have stored. We do have a we do have some still well, some then furniture whatever stored. we need. I mean, yeah. whatever over and above. Not whatever. much. Yeah. Not much. I mean, that that building is also a one-to-one -one building. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had not projected for that increased enrollment at the time that we looked at what we were going to do with that building. So while we have money going in there to replace, we replace it on a one third, one third cycle. Um, yeah, you know that cycle will be disrupted. Yeah. So I don't know if there's some way to roll it into a town meeting vote that would that would help a lot. Um, I can't remember what my other comment was. Uh, I, but actually, I, I, I want to make a motion, I'm not sure if it's appropriate right now, um, that we sort of form a committee or send it to a subcommittee to start the process of um, shifting lines or spending buffer zones, knowing that it's going to be a very long process and sort of giving ourselves enough time to do that. So your motion would be to refer to the Community Relations Committee. Would that be the committee? That yeah. Would okay, uh, yeah. I'll the issue motion. of buffer zones. Yes, let me refer to the Community Relations Committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, motion by Dr. Seuss, second by uh, Ms. Starks. Uh, so we now have a motion on the floor. Mr. Hainer. Would you repeat the motion, please? Sure. <laughs> Uh, a motion to um, refer to the Community Relations Subcommittee, um, the question of revisiting boundary lines between elementary schools and buffer zones. Of Clarification, shifting. we're not doing the redistricting, we're, we're just, just looking into what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. we're, we're maybe beginning that Starting process because under, with the understanding that it Thank is you. a long mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. Thank and you. the sooner we begin it better. Yes. Oh, well, we're not voting yet. I I'm sorry. I thought you would. No, I'm, I'm, I'm refer. I, no, uh, I'm refer. I'm giving you the floor to talk about. Uh, I was going to talk about the motion. Okay, so we'll, we'll restrict the discussion out of the motion. Is there any discussion on that? Well, you know, just to report on the task force. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe you can summarize it. But there were some members of the task force who would just like us to do this. Mm -hmm. right. So you should know that, and we should all know that there, there are people on the enrollment task force that would like this just passed by majority vote of the school committee that yeah, we shift the line. Mm -hmm. so, okay. I know that, but that's, that's... We have to involve the public. So community relations, if we pass this motion, community relations will look into it. Okay. All in Just, favor say yes. Yeah. Well, oh, a Mr. little Mr. more discussion. Mm -hmm. I was involved in it to some degree a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a very contentious process. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's something that should be taken very um, seriously mm -hmm. by this committee because you're disrupting mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 in doing this. So I would just put that out there as something to be, not just say, oh, it's another tool in the toolbox and it's going to fix our enrollment challenges. It won't. Yeah. It'll be another tool, but it, uh, you know, 25% buffer zones will slowly grow to 40% to 50%. Where does it end? And, and I don't know if the town wants to be just one big buffer zone. Mm -hmm. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. So I just want to caution the committee Brookline had to do it. They had to expand a few years after they passed theirs. And, uh, you know, it, like the legislators were mentioning, little by little, the, the, then the public, the public will for it and the political will might fall off. Mm -hmm. You do one change that you think is going to cover you for a long time and you and you be done with it. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, and, in fact, when I came back on the committee, we were at the... Uh, peak of the discussion and I have not still I'm still caffeinated from all the time <laughs> I spent in coffee shops talking to people yeah. about this and this is probably the thing I've spent more time talking about uh, in terms of working with constituents than, than anything else that I've seen as a school committee member. Mr. Hainer. Just want to clarify for the public we are not setting a committee up to redistrict yet mm. all we're doing is just looking at it and getting the ground work whether it's needed or whatever. I'm just trying to forestall the yeah, nine million emails. It's a that let's I'm have, have a conversation motion, um, Thank Starks. You. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what we're here, what we've heard, at least what I've heard, my interpretation of what I'm hearing is that 
certainly the lines between Hardy and Thompson, um, people in that part of town seem very open to opening the, the, those kinds of lines. But um, the math that I did on the number of students and families that would be affected is that there's over 300 families and students that would be affected by any one of these mm -hmm. massive shifts. Um, mm -hmm. And so we really have to, really have to watch what we're doing. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Um, yeah, I just want to speak to it. I, um, the reason I'm, I'm recommending this is one thing I think that the School Enrollment Task Force is interested in this. And, um, but, but one of the, the insights that I got from the meeting that we had last Thursday, the public visioning meeting, is that parents were a lot more accepting of this than I would have thought. And I don't, this is, of course is going to cause some anxiety. Um, I think it may be um, an easier process than last time, but it will be a hard process. I don't I want to underestimate that. Um, but, it, but parents saw the pictures and saw that the town was changing and sort of understood that one way to address those changes is to shift mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. to help the process, to help a but little I don't bit. think anybody, I, I don't, the ideas that came before the school enrollment task force, that was the first I, time I'm not they had about, come. I'm not talking about those particular ideas. I'm talking so about looking the fact at that we were the moving five things. schools. No, I'm talking, about, yeah. I'm talking about looking at the, as, as the population changes across town, looking at the possibility of shifting the boundaries. Um, I think that parents are, are open to this. I think it will be still painful. I had the benefit of not being on the committee during that last painful mm -hmm. process. <laughs> That's why she's so <laughs> eager to take it out. <laughs> We're so eager to give it to you. I mean, uh, just but, to... um, but I do think that parents understand the need. I do, I do think you'll get anxiety, but, you, but people generally <laughs> Okay, uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, you know, at, at, I did have conversations with some parents. I mean, this is so, if it's, un, it's unscientific. But I had, some right. I had some conversations with parents that, that did surprise me where they said they're open to it. Right, right. So mm -hmm. at the enrollment the, test, at the, the, the January 7th yeah. event, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. last Thursday. Yeah. So uh, on the motion to refer this to the um, Community Relations Subcommittee, which uh, is chaired by the person who made the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, that's a unanimous vote. Okay, back to the conversation. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I would like to thank publicly all the people that are part of the enrollment task force, especially uh, our, our group. Uh, some of the times it got a little heated, and I was one of the ones that got heated on it. Uh, but I think... The, Everyone was doing their job in the discussion mm -hmm. uh, like that. Um, it, it, it gets tough. Uh, each one comes from a perspective, mm -hmm. but I, I, I do applaud it. Uh, the parents came, and uh, I think slowly we're making progress. The vote the other night was very strong. Real quickly, I'd like to talk about uh, adding money uh, to the Thompson and stuff like that. I would be very nervous to even consider that right. I think it's a good idea, but to do it right now, uh, we have a, a thing going forward. Hopefully, if Dr. Bodie and stuff can cut down the, the, mm -hmm. the money uh, for the modular units, the difference in that might be able to, because right now, we came up with a figure in, in discussion of $400,000 to go forward. The other subcommittees are meeting, and to suggest that we needed more money right now, I think it would be a little hard to get through those subcommittees. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Any other discussion on the enrollment issue? Ah, yes. Uh, I, if I may, I just came from Capital Budget tonight and they authorized six hundred thousand dollars for oh. the modulars. Right. At Thompson? For just Thompson? Those for the two? two for the two at Thompson, yes, sir. Will that include soft costs? Can it include soft costs? There was no specificity about it whatsoever. Okay. However, um, I should also add that um, the bids came in for the for the Stratton modulars, and they were astronomically higher than we anticipated. We had budgeted $1.8 million, and they came in at $3.3 .3 million. Ouch. It is, there's an enormous demand. We're, we're going to interview the candidates with their RFPs and find, try to press them for why, but what we think is going on is there's such an enormous demand for modular classrooms in the area right now that they're just taking it to us. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned that the $600,000 could easily be gobbled up Right. By the costs themselves. But at least there's some money there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. We had a. Just a clarification on that. The number that was 
was brought to us, I thought it was coming from it was. ETBC was 400,000. Did it change that, that quick? It was from an article. Well, back based on what happened with the Stratton modulars, you know, we got the $1.8 million estimate from the modular companies, and then they came in with a bid that was so well, much higher. What I'm saying is, my understanding was the number that was brought to us came from PTPC after they had opened the bid. So, no. 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 That Before. Was, that was okay, true. hold on. Superintendent Bodie. Um, this number came from what Belmont's experience has been this year in terms of getting modulars. Um, they have, will be having the same issue. They, they're going to be able to get um, six modular classrooms for three years rental for about $1.2 million. We're looking for two for one year at the, at the moment. I also know that there is, I, I've been doing some internet searches in terms of what you can buy. And I think that you can buy, in fact, I know you can buy a modular for 200. Now that still seems very high. To, to underscore what um, Ms. Johnson was saying, in Bedford their experience was in the summer of 2014, so the summer before last, they had two modular classrooms they, they uh, purchased actually for 125,000, two. This last summer they needed one, 450,000. It's just, it's, it's, we're, we're in a very hot market. All of the surrounding towns around us are looking for modular classrooms to deal with enrollment growth. And um, while we did get this estimate from our company, it was done last year. And, but on the other hand, Time does make a difference. Uh, why is this dramatic is beyond me, but it's fairly dramatic. Oh, and the architects for the Stratton had confirmed with the modular companies their numbers. Mm -hmm. So then the modular companies turned around and right. yeah. so. That's joyous. Yeah. Um, Ms. Starks. Um, I also wanted to say that um, I, as a member of the Enrollment Task Force, I really appreciate the advocacy <clears throat> of all the parents who have um, sent mail, um, made phone calls, showed up at the meetings, because I really do feel like that's making a big difference. Um, a lot of the people who are, who are not on the school committee um, and are on that enrollment task force have no idea what the, you know, what costs really are. Like, so the, the other people are looking at peer dollars and not really thinking about the mental costs and the educational costs and a lot of those things. And I, I really feel like, and both several members have specifically stated the number of emails and calls they got. And I know for a fact that that made a difference. I mean, it, made, it was a vast difference in their attitude between one of those meetings and the other one, just in what they said at the table um, and what they were pushing for. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of that is the advocacy of the parents, mm -hmm. and I really just want to make sure that we thank them and we ask them to continue their advocacy because that really is mm -hmm. making a difference. All the people who show up at those meetings, all of their individual voices, I love their emails. I want them to continue to tell us their stories. Those are really what's helping to help people understand what people go through in this that it, again that I kept trying to say is that you know we're talking about kids and we're talking about their education mm -hmm. um, and I think it's so important that that comes across and that you know we can be there and say what's educationally sound but it's also very important that their voices are being heard and I just want to make sure we said thank you do we need a vote to endorse this recommendation that would be that would be nice yes. mm -hmm. uh, so but the two, the two modulars. The two the modulars. Yeah. At the top. So, Mr. Thielman. I move that we endorse the recommendation of the task force and the capital planning committee to place two modulars, modular classrooms at the Thompson School for 2016 17. Second. Okay. Moved by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Starks. That's the motion before us. Any discussion on the motion? We've talked about it. Uh, hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Except two small things. Uh, two, two small things. Keep All right. going. All right. Um, I just want to give you an update on where we are with park. Uh, we'll get this all out to parents, too. We did get an extension in order to know exactly what was going to happen in each one of the schools. We 
we have two schools which are going to do the online version, the CBT, and that will be Bishop Elementary and the middle school. And I think this will be a great opportunity for us to test um, our infrastructure uh, for this test. Uh, Dr. Chesson is going to meet with the PTO at Bishop in, in February, early February, to, to talk about it. We're also planning to have, but the date hasn't been set yet, um, a curriculum. What? February 24th. Oh, we did set it. Yes, February 24th. Oh, all right. <coughs> February 24th mm -hmm. is going to be um, the evening. We're going to have a, an open, uh, a district wide meeting for elementary parents to talk about the Common Core mm -hmm. and the park exam. And we'll get that all out to people. So that date is after the February vacation. Yes. And we've checked all of the evening meetings. Nothing's <clears throat> conflicting. So far, no. <laughs> no but if there's a change, we'll let everybody know. That, that is a challenge, I have to say. We're trying to get around that by now having this district calendar that everybody can compare. Yep. But having said that, it still remains a challenge. Seven so. tentatively? Hmm? Seven o'clock tentatively. Seven o'clock, yes. It'll be here in the auditorium. It is science. In the auditorium, okay. It is science night at the Bishop Elementary that night? Ah. Just so you know. Science at, Bish at the Bishop Elementary? But they will have already had a meeting on February that's right. 10th that's just for Bishop. So okay, I think good. that was the th thought around that. So what's the date now? Uh, the 23rd. 23rd. Uh, 24th. It's a Wednesday. But they won't have had the, 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 the Common Core. I've already been to Bishop and talked about the Common Core. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. So it's the day after the School Enrollment Task Force meeting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the day before our school committee meeting. It's a big It'll week. Be a fun week. And we will be we will be <laughs> certainly working with staff on, on this. Our intent and this is, is not right? has not changed yeah, at all. Right. Our intent is that we're going to take the test. We really want to see uh, mm -hmm. how our curriculum stands up with this the the, uh, the new test. We've done a lot of work over the last few years to really uh, align our curriculum with the standards and. Uh, uh, particularly in all areas for that matter but I I think that we're actually looking forward to forward to this opportunity we will do the training that may be necessary which I think is gonna be fairly minimal mm -hmm. and uh, we'll also let students have the experience of taking uh, certainly the online just just get familiar with the, the tools it's again it's really more just the the technical piece of this Dr. Chesson yes uh, uh, mr. I'm sorry Peter. Uh, is it, it's my understanding that you said that there's, there should be a way to compare last year's MCAS or the current MCAS scores with the park the results. The Department of back. Education has a crosswalk which does that. You're comfortable with that? The Department of Education has a crosswalk that does. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, they, uh, Mr. Schlickman and I have actually had this discussion, and I think that they pro they have a fairly substantial um, psychometric um, mm -hmm. evidence for what uh, they're doing. So, yeah, the, I guess the, I do. Then let me that. rephrase it. Is it something you think the committee members would be able to use? Yes, in that they will be calculating growth scores. Yes. Thank you. Right. We'll, we'll still see how our subgroups and our students in general do vis-a-vis -vis targets. Those don't, the targets aren't changing um, for what we have to achieve. Thank you. Uh, and the last thing is just to invite the, invite the community and to, to remind everyone here that there is going to be a celebration for Martin Luther King's birthday this coming Monday. But it's a particularly special one because we're going to celebrate the 50 years of Metco in Arlington. Hard to believe it's, it's that number of years, but it, it is. And uh, three people will be uh, recognized that evening, our, our current Metco director, Margaret Credle Thomas, as well as our previous Metco director, Steve Pereira, and then, of course, the icon of Metco, Gene McGuire. And, and as in past years, Pearl Morrison will be our, our uh, moderator for the evening. And that concludes so, the superintendent's report. We now move to the consent agenda. Mr. Hainer. I need to, uh, we need to separate it a bit. Uh, I did not make the motion to approve consent agenda or accept the 11, 12 minutes I was gone that night. I think it's in the, uh, the, uh, the minutes for 1210? 
Oh, okay. Okay, I, I, I will be abstaining from that, so I need, we, need, we can't do it all at one vote. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying, 12-10. And the minutes have me uh, making a motion. I wasn't there. Okay. Um, then then uh, for the, the, the minutes for the 12-10, is that what's? Yes. Yep. Okay, so the, the, we, we won't vote that at all. Okay. Uh, pending a correction. Okay. So the, the consent agenda will be for the 1217 meeting and the warrant, okay? So the um, consent agenda, all items will be voted as one. Uh, uh, the approval of minutes for the draft minutes dated uh, December 17th, 2015, and approval of a warrant dated uh, December 17th, 2015, warrant number 16093, total warrant amount $395,073.91. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? The consent agenda is adopted. We now go to subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Policies and procedures, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We had a policies and procedures subcommittee meeting uh, on Monday, January 11th, 8 in the morning. We uh, discussed uh, various policies dealing with uh, professional staff salary schedules, um, electronic signatures on warrants, which we still need to do a little research on whether or not we can develop a new policy that will allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I expect that we'll have something for First Street at our next meeting concerning uh, some changes uh, pursuant to state law and student restraint um, policy. Um, background checks also were discussed briefly with the fingerprint policy that we adopted. Uh, recently and whether or not we needed to do any updates or uh, revision on that. Um, and lastly, we'll be meeting, I would think, probably early February to deal with the charge of tonight, which was selecting a, possibly a new meeting date and time mm -hmm. for the committee um, and any other business for the 1516 mm -hmm. calendar year. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey is absent. Does I had a question on policies and report? procedures. Oh, oh, Mr. Thielman. Policies and procedures, did you, are you guys, did I hear, are you, Reviewing the principal appointment policies? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. salary oh, schedule. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, so, yeah, okay. Okay, Got budget, it. is somebody representing for budget? I, sh I shared the one, yeah, you, it was you her request for you f to get input from you folks. Okay. Uh, facilities, uh, Ms. Starks. Um, let's see, we have a meeting next Thursday, uh, so a week from today at 5.30. Uh, we will uh, be discussing, thinking about Audison, how we put together options, timelines, and costs, uh, especially as we need to head into the school enrollment task force with those. Um, we also are going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of updates. Uh, I want to also understand, I hope to talk to Mr. Liggett about his survey um, and when we can get information from that, um, when he's going to close it out and when we might be able to actually get some data from that. Thank you. Uh, District Accountability, Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. We met today at 5.30, and uh, we came to an agreement, I think, on the evidence we want the superintendent to present for the, the, uh, her report on the goals for the year, her, for, for her evaluation, and we noted in the policy that an interim report is due to us on March 31st. So um, I'll put together... The, the, the what we agreed to should be the evidences mm -hmm. and distributed to the committee. And how do we want to get feedback? Do you want to talk about it at a school committee meeting? Do you want to put it on the agenda? Do you want people to just kind of get back to, the, to me and then we can talk about it as a subcommittee? I think, that, uh, I think that we would at least need to reference it at, a, at the next meeting. Okay, so <laughs> I'll have everything ready for like this. Like a policy, like have a yeah. couple of reads. Mm -hmm. Have a read. Get okay. Some yeah. <clears throat> that, right. That's an excellent idea. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll have it for first read for next week. Okay. Uh, two weeks from now. Next meeting. Next meeting. Okay. Uh, community relations. Uh, Dr. Seuss, you ran a wonderful event last week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so I finally, uh, the advocate though didn't cover it. So. <laughs> It was, no, it didn't. There's an article today. Yes, there was. Oh, today? Today. Yeah, today. I, was, I was like looking through the newspaper. I couldn't find it. Okay. Maybe I, I just missed gotta it. got to read it Sorry. online. I got to read it better. You did a great okay. job. Okay, great. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you. I, I don't want to take too much time. Um, I do want to take the opportunity that I didn't take before to thank a couple of people, if I, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, 
So a lot of people helped make the meeting a success. In fact, if I was on my own, it wouldn't have been a success. So um, I want to uh, thank uh, Joe Curo, who worked very early with uh, Stacy Smith, who's a, an Arlington parent. I want to thank Dr. Bodhi. I want to thank um, Community Relations Committee, Judson, and Cindy. I actually especially want to thank Cindy, who was at the very, very long meeting <laughs> and who has a this amazing mind who sort of can get at the core of what's important and took a very complicated meeting and simplified it and um, it's much better for your for your input. Um, Linda Hansen played a similar role in some earlier meetings and was did an amazing job presenting people's values um, to the community. So she did a tremendous amount of work and um, again it would have been a much messier, much less coherent um, meeting without her her her, um, her work on that. So that's what I want to say. So I know I've been getting some some praise for this, and I want to say, on my own, it wouldn't have worked. But <laughs> with all of you guys, it worked. Um, I just finished a preliminary report. Uh, it was very painful. I found myself doing my taxes to avoid doing this preliminary report. That's how painful it was, <laughs> because I had to take. 30 pages of text of various people and try to condense it into a much smaller report. Um, there's gonna have to be a lot more work on it, but actually I think the report is less important, frankly, than the fact that everyone came together, that we had over 200 people um, talking about issues that are important, grappling with all the complications, and um, there was a, a variety of views in that room, and there's no way that the report would reflect all those views. And so even though I'm gonna say this was mentioned a lot or something. Um, there's just no way to reflect everybody's views. But it was good that we were talking and we really, really value hearing from the community. That's it. Um, oh. Executive, session. Executive session minute review subcommittee. I have a, a scheduled meeting with uh, town council tomorrow to go over the process of reviewing the minutes. Warren committee, everybody got paid? I think so. Okay. I signed the bill. School enrollment task force, we've uh, Be talked a lot about that. It's um, true. Yeah. Um, announcements? Um, any announcements? I just have an interesting, yeah, Mr. Pierce. A lot of good theater going on this weekend. I know the Thielman children and the Pierce children are also uh, acting again in uh, the Monotomy Musical Theater's production of Little Mermaid Junior. Um, so you'll have the opportunities to see school committee children acting. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unreal. Is it, is so it a Sunday show? It's a Sunday afternoon show at 2, Saturday evening 7, Saturday afternoon at 2. Friday evening. Where are the Thielmans? Uh, yeah. We're in Cast Belmont, right? Belmont Town Hall. Okay. What, what Arlington number? group, a lot of Arlington kids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What time do you guys? We're invading Saturday Belmont. Night. Do they have a tax base? <laughs> <laughs> they we'll sure do. We'll be invading their town hall. Mr. Heiner. Uh, the Edco Roundtable is meeting next Wednesday at uh, 9, 9.30, uh, School Committee Roundtable. I realize a lot of you folks work, but it's it. I represent us, but it's open to everyone that can make it at 9.30. It's a group of school committee members that belong to EDCO and sharing, and it's very informative and good things. Kirstie's come with me a couple of times. Jennifer, you're welcome if you can yeah, yeah. to come up. And the rest of you are welcome too if you want to play hooky. You want to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if any of you know Lauren Wu. I know that uh, Jeff does. Uh, she is the liaison to the Accountability and Assistance uh, Advisory Council for the State Board of Education, and she's also the director of Level 5 Project Implementation for DESE. Uh, I saw her on Wednesday, and she is celebrating the fact that after many bids and overbids, she is moving to Arlington. <laughs> so uh, she bought a house and, and she's bought, bought a condo around the corner from the um, uh, from from the uh, Hardy School, uh, and uh, you know. And she, she fought to get into this East town. Arlington. <laughs> yes, East Arlington, yes, yes, yes. Oh, good. Uh, and, and this is relevant because she fought hard. She, she, it was like about the fifth or sixth condo she tried to buy yeah. and was just overbid and overbid and overbid on, on them. So, yes, the real estate market is hot out there. Did you see we are the 27th most competitive, East Arlington, 27th most competitive area mm -hmm. in the entire country? It's a wonderful. Arlington. It's a yes. wonderful place to live. And with that, I think we've exhausted. Uh, do we have any other executive session, Mr. You know, there's Siegel. other other towns, but 27th in the country. I would have thought yeah. the top hundred would all have been California. Nope. Mm -hmm. Nope. Actually, eight are in Massachusetts. 
Hearing none. Uh, hearing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, uh, executive session? Oh, we are not going to executive session. Okay. May I just ask the chair for the next meeting to do a report because I assume you're in negotiations with yes, the Yes, we, uh, we're, we're scheduling a meeting and I hope to have a report out for the next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, so a motion to adjourn from, who wants to go home? I did. So moved. Okay, moved by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Starks to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good job. We're done. <laughs>